Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to call this meeting in the Prince William County School Board to order. Uh, motion is now in order for the approval of the meeting agenda. Ms. Wall. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Yep. A second. Um, okay, any discussion? <laughs> Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Ralston, motion passed. Moving on to, um, to the motion to enter closed session. A motion is in order. Ms. Wall. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I move that pursuant to Virginia Code section 2.2-3711 and 2.2-3712, the Prince William County School Board enter closed session for the following reasons. One, to discuss with staff the appointment, transfer, release, assignment, reassignment, and promotion <clears throat> of specific officers and employees pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A1, and two, to evaluate the Ombudsman and approve annual performance goals for the Office of the Ombudsman, <clears throat> Ombudsman for 2023-24, pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A1. Three, to discuss with Division Council and staff actual or probable litigation and specific legal matters involving specific staff and students pursuant to Virginia Code Sections 2.2-3711A7 and 8. Four, to consult with legal counsel employed or retained by the school board to receive legal advice regarding the school division's policies on search and seizure pursuant to Virginia Code Sections 2.2-3711A7 and 8. Five, to discuss the qualifications and selection of the student representatives to the school board for the 2023-24 school year pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A1 and 2, and 22.1-86.1. <clears throat> Six, to review disciplinary matters for specific students that would involve the disclosure of information contained in the scholastic record for individual students, and to receive legal advice regarding same as provided by Virginia Code Sections 2.2-3711A2 and 8, and seven, to discuss and receive briefings by staff members related to the security of school facilities, the safety of persons using such facilities, and actions taken to respond to such matters, where discussion in an open meeting would jeopardize the security of such facilities pursuant to Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A19. Do I have a second? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, Williams. Second. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Ralston, motion passed. The Prince William County School Board will now enter closed session and return at approximately seven o'clock. The Prince William County School Board is now returning to open session from closed session. Uh, we will move on to the closed session certification, agenda item 8.01, a motion is in order. Ms. Wall. Mr. Chairman, I recommend, or I move that pursuant to Virginia Code section 2.2-3712, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board meeting of June 7th, 2023, be certified by adopting the following resolution. 
Now therefore be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Williams. A second. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Ralston, motion passed. Uh, moving on to the closed session action items. A motion is in order for 9.01. Ms. Ms. Wall. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the appointments, reassignment, and releases of specific employees as presented in closed session. Do I have a second? <clears throat> Ms. Williams, or Ms. Jesse. Second. Ms. Jesse seconds the motion. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is six yes, one abstain, Latif, one absent, Ralston, motion passed. Moving on to 9.02, Ms. Wall, a motion is in order. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board uphold the hearing officer's recommendation of dismissal in employee case number T23-135 and further that the chairman at large is authorized to provide a written decision to the employee reflecting the school board's decision. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Zargapur. A second. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Ralston, motion passed. On to 9.03, a motion is in order. Vice Chair Wall. Mr. Chairman, I move. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve an annual retainer agreement for fiscal year 2023-24 for legislative lobbying legal services provided by James Council Esquire. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I second. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Motion, Ralston, motion passed. Moving on to 9.04, Vice Chair Wall. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session consent agenda items as presented in closed session. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse. A second. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent, Ralston, motion passed. Okay, thank you very much. So now that wraps up closed session action items, am I correct? Okay, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight we have our student representative, Chance Williams, up here on the dais with us to lead. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, allegiance to the, the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Chance. This is our um, student representative's last meeting of the school year, and that's Chance Williams from Forest Park High School. We have also in our audience our other student rep, Danya Sharifi from um, Gainesville High School, and uh, Christian Daniels from Hilton High School. And uh, you'll be hearing from them a little bit later. Okay, moving on to Thriving Futures Focus. We have a big night this evening, folks. It is time for one of the most enjoyable portions of our school board meetings, and that is launching Thriving Futures. We dedicate this time during our meetings to recognize students, staff members, and students who have earned an honor or an award at the state 
or national level. We appreciate how those, these honorees have positively represented Prince William County Public Schools the school, and the school board is proud to recognize them publicly for their accomplishments. Because we are approaching the end of the school year, we have several recognitions tonight. And I ask our guests to exercise patience and bear with us as we recognize our wonderful students, staff, and schools. We begin tonight in the Occoquan District with Miss Lily Jesse. Miss Jesse. Thank you, Dr. Lissy. Last meeting, we recognized students who are in first place at the State Distributive Education Club of America, or DECA, competition. One of our students had a scheduling conflict, but I'm pleased to share that he is here tonight. Chuck Sullivan, a graduating senior at Woodbridge High School, plays first in sports and entertainment marketing for the state. Chuck is here tonight with his business education teacher, Nicole Healy, and Brian Carback, administrative intern. Mrs. Healy, would you like to say a few words about Chuck? Good evening, Dr. Latif, members of the school board, and Dr. McDade. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight to recognize Chuck for his outstanding accomplishment. The DECA Sports and Entertainment Marketing Competition required Chuck to take a written test and perform in two events that presented biz business challenges with role plays. The competition blends the skills and knowledge Chuck learned in class with his application of real-world solving, uh, problem-solving skills related to the industry. Chuck earned first place for the state and then went on to represent Woodbridge High School, Prince William County Schools, and Virginia at the DECA International Career Development um, Conference in Orlando, Florida. Chuck just graduated on Sunday night and he will be studying sports and recreation uh, management at James Madison University in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Congratulations, Chuck, for this award and for graduating high school earlier this week. Thank you, Ms. Healy and Mr. Karnbeck for coming and we appreciate you joining us. Now we will move on to our Con Fellows, continuing with Miss Jessie of the Occoquan District. Wow, what an honor. I'm pleased to announce that four school, four school principals who are selected to take part in the Con Distinguished Principals Fellowship for 20, 2023 to 24. Because of this, because this is the first year Prince William County has participated in the Con Fellow programs, these four outstanding principals represent an, the inaugural cohort for Prince William County Schools. The principals are four of just 65 principals chosen nationwide to be a part of this 23-24 cohort. The CONS program recognizes and supports excellence in education, supporting strong school leaders to improve education for students. The fellowship provides principals with an opportunity to, to flourish professionally, intellectually, and personally. One of the four principals, hold on guys. One of the four principals leads a school in Alcorn District. Elise Zifferow, principal at Carydale Elementary School has more than 18 years of experience as a result of Ms. Zifferow's excellent leadership and collaborative efforts of her outstanding team. This year, Carydale was recognized as a national Elementary Secondary Act Distinguished School for Closing Achievement Gap. In addition, Carydale Elementary earned the first visible learning certified school in Virginia in 2023. Zephyro, please come forward and say a few words. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Ms. Jesse, and thank you to the school board and Dr. McDade. Um, I'm incredibly proud and honored to be selected as a Con Fellow for this upcoming school year and represent the division in this capacity. I'm really looking forward to um, the, le the leadership experience and learning from other leaders across the nation and bringing that back to um, the school and also our students and our division. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Congratulations, Ms. Efro. The remaining Con Fellows are located in the Brentsville District with Ms. Adele Jackson. Uh, Mr. Adele Jackson will introduce these distinguished principals for us. Ms. Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, 
Dr. Mark Marinobo, principal of Cedar Point Elementary School, hello, <laughs> began his career as an educator teaching in Fakir Public Schools. Dr. Marinobo joined PWCS in March of 2002 as a teacher at Yorkshire Elementary School. From there, he became an assistant principal at Vaughan Elementary School and served as a special education coordinator. In 2004, he accepted his position at the principal at Triangle Elementary School. During his nine years as principal, he significantly closed the achievement gap for all subgroups and students. Dr. Marinobo became the principal of wonderful Cedar Point Elementary in 2013. As principal, he launched the tech lab at Cedar Point to get students involved in technology projects such as coding. Please come forward and say a few words about your Khan Fellowship Award and congratulations. <clears throat> All right, to the, to the school board, Dr. McDay, thank you for this uh, tremendous opportunity. I wasn't nervous until I could see myself talking on the jumbotron, so that, that throws it for a loop. I'd love to go around and tell stories about each and every one of the board members here and uh, some, some great people around uh, in this room. But I, I, always, I always told myself, I'm always going to call out Miss Jesse. I'm very thankful to you, Miss Jesse. Uh, Miss Jesse, many years ago when I was <clears throat> um, a teacher trying to make that transition to, to administration, I needed somebody to give me a, a chance and an opportunity. Miss Jesse gave me that, so I'm always uh, in debt to you for that. Thank you for teaching me everything. I know. Let's give Miss Jesse a round of applause. We appreciate you, Miss Jesse. Okay. I think in this role as educators, our, our job is to, to look for uh, the greatness in others and, and find that, and, uh, and that's really the work that we do each and every day. So I'm just thankful for this opportunity. I look forward to learning with uh, these great colleagues. We're very excited about uh, what we'll be learning in this next step. Also, thank you, Dr. Hart. Appreciate working for you. You, you guys are amazing. Uh, and so thank you, team. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate you. Next, we have Marissa Miranda, principal of the wonderful Glen Cook Elementary School, who began a career as a first grade teacher in Germany. She continued her teaching career in the United States and became an assistant principal at Dumfries Elementary in 2014. Miss Miranda became principal at Glen Cook Elementary School in 2017. Over the last six years, she had made it a place where students and staff can collaborate and find new and innovative ways to accomplish all things. Eager to share her knowledge and experience with others, Ms. Miranda has presented at several conferences, with the most recently held virtually in February 2023 for Reading League Professional Panel on the topic, Current Practices and Evidence-Based Literacy Instruction from the Field. With 19 years of experience in the field of education, Ms. Miranda is a dynamic leader that is student-focused and possesses dynamic communication skills. Please come forward and say a few words, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jackson, Dr. McDade, all the school board, dynamic communication skills. That's a lot to follow now. So I just want to say we, all of us are so excited about this opportunity. I can't be more excited. I was a teacher in Prince William County, an assistant principal, a principal. I'm excited to bring back all the things that we're going to learn. We're very, very excited. So thank you so much for the recognition. Great. Um, our final con fellow is Mr. Neil Beach, a principal of Gainesville High School. Mr. Beach is attending his daughter's recital tonight and sends his regrets. Mr. Beach has over 22 years of experience as an educator and is passionate about furthering his impact on his school and his professional communities. Mr. Beach began his career as a biology teacher at Brentsville District High School. During this time, he taught biology for students in grades 9 through 12 and achieved a 100% pass rate on the biology SOL for the 2003 to all the way to 2005 school years. Afterward, he accepted the role of Cambridge and testing coordinator at Brentsville District High School. And from there, he became assistant principal at Osborne Park High for three years before becoming principal there. During his time as principal at Osborne Park High, Mr. Beach was awarded a 25,000 Millikan Educator Award for his work, which included increasing participation in AP programs. And he's not here today, but I'm going to say congratulations again. Congratulations to our Con Fellows. And before we take a few pictures, can I please ask the family members of our award winners to stand and be recognized? If you're here, please stand. I can ask the folks, um, I think um, Diane will rec um, direct people up to the front for, for photographs.
All right, all right, all right. Well, it is now time to recognize our, our state-level science fair winners. After we recognize all science winners, Ms. Julia Renberg, the Prince William County School Supervisor of Science and Director of Prince William Manassas Regional Science and Engineering Fair, will speak on behalf of the students. Ms. Jen Wall, Vice Chair and Representative of the Gainesville Magisterial District, will recognize our first group. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Ibru Airorgun, so I'm sorry, I slaughtered that. Is that pretty good? Of Battlefield High School, won first place in health sciences and biomedical engineering at the State Science Fair. Yashvir Sabarwal, also from Battlefield High. Let's see, where, raise your hand. There you are. Won first place in computer science. They are here tonight with assistant principal Chris McMillan. There he is. Congratulations. Um, thank you, Ms. Wall, and congratulations to our Battlefield High School students. Next up is Ms. Adele Jackson. Ms. Jackson. It is my pleasure to recognize Ellie Kim, student at Gainesville High School, and the Governor's School. Is Ellie Kim here? Go ahead. Oh, okay. At Innovation Park, and Visa. Mahan at, uh, and Madison Nally, both students at Osborne Park High School, and the Governor's School at Innovation Park, whose team won first place in the Computation of Biology and Translational Medicine and Grand Prize in Animal Behavior and Social Sciences at the Virginia State Science and Engineering Fair. The principals are Neil Beach, Lisa Marie Kane, and Dr. Jason Calhoun. Fantastic, and, and you know, I might add that each year we continue to do well at the Virginia State Science Fair, and, 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 and the, the winners keep increasing, so keep it all up, folks. Next, um, so congratulations to our State Science Fair champions. We will now move on to the winners of the Virginia Junior Academy of Science Symposium Awards. Uh, Ms. Zargapur, Lisa Zargapur, the Coles Magisterial District, will recognize these students. Ms. Zargapur. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Uh, Layla Musafi. Co student at Colgan High School and the Governor's School at Innovation Park, Lila Brown, attending Manassas City Schools and the Governor's School at Innovation Park, and Rayanne Ferrer, 
Ferrer, a student both at Brentsville District High School and the Governor's School at Innovation Park, make up a team who earned first place in the medicine and health category at the Virginia Junior Academy of Science Symposium. Their principals include Dr. Catherine Mainz and Dr. Jason Calhoun. Congratulations. Armand Latif, a student at Colgan High School and the Governor's School at Innovation Park, and Arav Patel, student at Osborne Park High School and the Governor's School, earned first place in environmental and earth sciences. Rania Sophia Latif, student at Colgan High School, earned first place in zoology and earned the, is it VABE? VABE Zoology Award at the VJAS Symposium. Their principals are Dr. Jason Calhoun, Lisa Marie Kane, and Dr. Tim Healy. Congratulations. <laughs> but wait, I have much more to share about Rania. She was selected as the delegate to the American Junior Academy of Science. The top four research projects by an individual or team are given in an invitation to represent VJAS at the annual meeting. At the end of the meeting, students are inducted as lifetime fellows into the J AJAS. In addition, Rania was selected to lead the junior officers of VJAS as co-president for the 2023-24 school year. <laughs> but wait, <laughs> that is not all, there's more after these messages. No, uh, Rania is one of four students in the nation, in the nation, to receive the National Neuroscience Research Prize. This award recognizes scientific skill and potential for scientific contributions in the field of neuroscience. This is the first time a PWCS student won this prize. Rania's research focused on the effects of sleep deprivation and the circadian rhythm disruptions on a fruit fly's lifespan mood, and addiction-like behaviors. And Rania, I would personally love to know more about this. You're gonna to have to tell me. Congratulations, Rania. Thank you, Ms. Zargapur, and I'm very impressed with our students' accomplishments in science. And, and, and to wrap up this section, first, you know, we didn't mention all of these terrific students have incredibly great science teachers at their schools as well. Incredibly great folks who are supporting their science fair efforts um, at their schools, and, and, and we, we have to recognize their parents who, I don't know if it's later in my script, but uh, it is, but, but anyways, great parents. I would like to ask Julia Redenberg and Prince William County School Supervisor of Science and Director of the Prince William County Manassas Regional Science and Engineering Fair to say, fair to say a few words, and then I'll recognize the parents later. Thank you, Dr. Lightsafe, and good evening. And thank you for stealing my thunder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I want to begin by also congratulating our students for their outstanding performance and achievements. Um, not so long ago, Prince William County used to send only one project to, to International Science Fair. This year, there were 11 students representing six projects. So this is evidence of division's commitment to support students in STEM. And that is critical because work of this caliber is never about one person. It takes a team. And that's where you stole my thunder. <laughs> so having said that, uh, I would like on behalf of the students to thank the school administration, science fair coordinators, teachers, and of course their parents, and anybody else who provided mentorship from the day the student put the project proposal forward to the regionals, to the state, and then all the way to Dallas, Texas. Um, this work deserves recognition, and I'm so grateful we're here tonight. Thank you so much. Ms. Renberg, whenever there's a storm coming and you have brought a great storm, it's a good storm, thunderclap twice is okay. We're good with that. So thank you so much. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think we should discount, I, I, I want to reemphasize, you know, five years ago we were sending only one student or one team to the International Science Fair. We have now sent five teams or students, 11 students this year alone. It is fantastic and it is a great um, uh, you know, uh, merit for our school division and, and, and recognition for our school division nationally. So we can't thank you enough. 
Um, congratulations to our award-winning students in science. We are very proud of your accomplishments. At this time, I'd like the families of these students to stand and be recognized. Please, all the families. If you should stand up. Oh. Um, and before we bring, bring in the next group to be recognized, I ask the school board members to, um, okay, we're going to walk to the front and take a picture with our science award winners. Please um, come to the front there. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone again for your patience. This is, you know, as we get to the end of the school year, there's so many things happening, so many things wrapping up. We still have, I think last I heard, five sports teams, if not at, the, at, at least five teams, still in champion, state championship contention. So we might be back here on the 21st with a lot more things going on, including um, all sorts of other things. So again, congratulations um, to all our award winners. In science, okay, we're moving on next. Uh, it is now our, my pleasure to recognize the nine schools in Prince William County named Virginia Music Educators Association, the VMEA Blue Ribbon Award winners. At this time, I would like to ask Ms. Wall to recognize her schools. Ms. Wall. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Congratulations to the nine schools from Prince William County Public Schools that received the Virginia Music Educators Association, VMEA, Blue Ribbon Award. This award is the highest award given to schools' music programs in the Commonwealth of Virginia and recognizes excellence achieved in band, orchestra, and choral performance. Each year, secondary band, choir, and orchestra ensembles perform at the Virginia Band and Orchestra Directors Association District Concert Assessment and Virginia Choral Directors Association Stage Assessment. And during these assessments, student ensembles perform for a panel of adjudicators who assess students on their performance and provide feedback based on specific categories such as tone, intonation, rhythm, technique, diction, balance and blend, and artistry and musicianship. To qualify for this award, all dis disciplines in a school must receive a rating of superior at the state music concert assessments. At the end of the Blue Ribbon Recognitions, we will ask Ed Stevenson, Supervisor for Fine and Performing Arts, to say a few words about our amazing music programs. But first, from the Gainesville District, I am proud to recognize Battlefield High School, represented this uh, evening by Assistant Principal Chris McMillan. Um, Chris, please wave. <laughs> Hi, Alana, so we can see you. And Bull Run Middle School is also a Blue R Ribbon Award winner, right there. Yes, and they are represented this evening by Principal Matthew Fithian and Connor Haupt. Congratulations.
Thank you, Vice Chair Wall. Next, Mrs. Dell Jackson will recognize the schools in the Brentsville Magisterial District. Thank you, Dr. Chief. I'm excited to offer congratulations to Gainesville High School, represented this evening by Andrew Barton, Assistant Principal. Aurora McCullough, choir student, and, and Ann Bell, orchestra student. I'm also excited to offer congratulations to Patriot High School, represented tonight by David Van Gelder, assistant principal. <laughs> Elizabeth Selby, choir director. Congratulations. Wonderful, thank you, Ms. Jackson. It is now my pleasure to introduce Justin Wilk of the Potomac Magisterial District. Mr. Wilk. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Potomac Shores Middle School has been named a Blue Ribbon Award winner. The school is represented tonight by Cassandra De Placido, our assistant principal, Ryan Burr, Ryan Burr and Miles Matlavage, the band directors, Andrew Kerper and Lisa Flowers, our choir directors, and Amy Ruhlman, the orchestra director. Congratulations, Potomac Shores. Thank you, Mr. Wilk. Ms. Lily Jesse is next in the recognitions in the Occoquan Magisterial District. Thank Ms. Jesse. Thank you, Dr. Latif. It is my pleasure to recognize Woodbridge High School as a Blue Ribbon Award winner. They re they're represented tonight by Brian Kernbach, administrative intern, and the wonderful, wonderful Taryn Woods. You know, I love her, orchestra director. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jesse. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Lisa Zargapur of the Coles Magisterial District. Ms. Zargapur. Oh, thank you, Dr. Latif. This is my favorite because I am a music teacher and I'm looking out here and I'm seeing some of my children's teachers. I'm seeing my own mentors. I'm seeing colleagues. I love all of you. I am so glad you are here. Uh, it is my pleasure to recognize C.D. Hilton High School as a Blue Ribbon Award winner. Those present tonight include Eric Switzer, Assistant Principal, Tommy Tutweiler, King Tut, Choir Director, Michael Basham, band director, and Dennis Brown, orchestra director. So wave so we can see you guys. From Osborne Park High School, um, Lisa Marie Kane here is tonight with Dominic Izo, choir who's our choir director, Stephen Kelsey, orchestra director, and Stephen Daly, a band director. Please wave, gentlemen. And finally, <clears throat> Charles J. Colgan Senior High School, represented by Dr. Tim Healy and Don McGee, band director, is a recipient of this prestigious award. Congratulations. Wave at us, guys. <laughs> All right. Congratulations, Battlefield, Colgan, Gainesville, Hilton, Osborne Park, Patriot, and Woodbridge High School's and Bull Run in Potomac Shores Middle School is on this outstanding accomplishment. Uh, before calling Mr. Stevenson up here to speak, we have one more recognition to make in music. It is my pleasure to introduce Lori Williams, Woodbridge Magisterial District, to share information about a division-wide award. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Based on the recognition of these nine schools, it should be no surprise to learn that Prince William County Public Schools has been named a Best Community for Music Education by the NAM Foundation. Now, in its 24th year, the Best Communities for Music Education designation is awarded to districts that demonstrate outstanding achievement in efforts to provide music access and education to all students. To qualify for the Best Communities designation, PWCS answered detailed questions about funding, graduation requirements, music class participation, instruction time, facilities, support for the music program, and community music making programs. Responses were verified by school officials and reviewed by the Music Research Institute at the University of Kansas. The NAM Foundation is a nonprofit supported, is, is a nonprofit supported in part by the National Association of Music Merchants and its 15,000 member companies and individual professionals. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Ed Stevenson, Supervisor for Fine and Performing Arts, to come forward to say a few words. Jasmine Hawkins, Administrative Coordinator for Fine and Performing Arts, is unable to be here with us this evening due to illness. Mr. Stevenson. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Latif, members of the school board, and Dr. McDade, uh, we 
As you can see, we do have outstanding music education programs in Prince William County that make a big difference in the lives of our students. Uh, for many of our students, receiving a quality music education is truly a life-changing experience. This would not be possible without our dedicated music educators, hardworking students, and supportive parents who work tirelessly to make our music program successful. I know this firsthand because I am married to Battlefield's um, new band booster president. It's gonna be a great year. <laughs> anyway, I am, I am, in all honesty, continually impressed and humbled by the passion and the, and the commitment of this community. Um, and I also know that our vital music education programs would not be possible without the steadfast support of this school board and superintendent. So on behalf of the entire music education community, I would like to thank you for everything you do to support quality music programs in our school division. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams, and congratulations to Mr. Stevenson, Ms. Hawkins, and to all the teachers and administrators, administrators who contributed to the NAM, NAM Award. I ask all family members for our Blue Ribbon Awards to stand and be recognized if we have any folks in attendance. Please, rise. Anybody back there? Okay, well, woo! All right. I think no one should question the fact that um, we have been committed as a school board and a school division to music in every corner of our county and to STEM in every corner of our county. And you can see that tonight by the representation we have brought here this evening. Dr. McDade, some words. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, I have quite a few words this evening and I'm just overjoyed at just the level of excellence that exists in Prince William County across this school division. I wanna acknowledge Chuck Sullivan from Woodbridge High School and congratulate him on his state win. Um, on behalf of uh, myself and PWCS, I'm incredibly proud to be, have the first year of um, school leaders being recognized in the National Con Distinguished Fellowship. We have distinguished leaders in our school division, and it is time for them to be um, in the national spotlight to showcase what's happening here as well as learn um, and be professionally developed to bring research and practice back to Prince William County. A little bit about Con, it's a rigorous application, a very rigorous application process. The principals who won this fellowship went through a day-long process where um, the Khan Fellows came out to our school division, visited their schools, interviewed students, parents, faculty, and staff, looked at data, evaluations. Um, so it was a really rigorous process, but it will be an enriching one-year program that focuses on authentic challenges and measurable results to more readily apply academic research to practice and for uh, leaders to take an active approach to their learning. So I wanna congratulate our Khan Fellows because this also is um, showcasing the excellence in Prince William County on a national stage. The long-awaited results of the science fair has kept us on the edge of our seats, and so congratulations to the winners of the Virginia State Science and Engineering Fair, as well as the Virginia Junior Academy of Science Symposium. Special acknowledgement to Rania Latif, uh, the VJS winner, and one of only four students in the nation to win the Neuroscience Research Prize. That is nothing to take lightly, so I'm extremely proud of Rania and all of our students. These honors really reflect the important lessons happening in our division STEM programs and the central learning of characteristics like those defined in our PWCS profile of a graduate. The students that we've showcased throughout this year represent what we believe are the characteristics that will lead to them creating a thriving future for themselves and their communities. Also, congratulations to the nine schools that received the Virginia Music Educators Association's Blue Ribbon Award. Uh, my son is a musician. I know the impact that um, not just music education, but arts education has on our students, and it makes a world of difference for those students that could potentially be disengaged from school to be engaged in school and to be able to thrive and prosper. So I want to thank each and every one of you because it was a music teacher that inspired my child to re-engage in school. So I'm deeply grateful for what you're doing for our students here in Prince William County Public Schools. It's an honor. Um, to be recognized by the National Association for Music Merchants as a 2023 Best Communities for Music Education. Wow, 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 wow. These awards punctuate the rich 
educational experience and prolific environment for our students in band, orchestra, and choir. Thank you so much for your time, dedication, commitment, and sheer passion to serving our students in Prince William County Public Schools. Congratulations to students, family, staff, and community who have made education, music education, part of a holistic education because arts education is not separate and apart. It's a part of the core of what we do. So thank you so much. Congratulations. So at, uh, at this time, uh, so, so we'll have one more launching Thriving Futures recognition on the June 21st board meeting for uh, robotics and sports state champions and anybody else that we have to recognize that come up in the next few weeks. At this time, we would like to take two pictures, one with the high school blue ribbon winners and one with the middle school blue ribbon winners and NAM. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. So now moving on to the adoption of the consent agenda. <laughs> Ms. Wall, we're on 1201. Vice Chair Wall. 
Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I second. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Jackson. Um, as I received a couple emails on um, some of the impact statements, I just want to bring to the public attention three impact statements that impact the Brentsville District and just point out that decisions are not um, for land usage are not within the purview of the school board. Um, but you can read why the impact statements, why the school board is opposed. The three that are coming to the Brentsville District are um, High Point, Strathmore, and Bristol Crossing. High Point is uh, going to contribute to overcrowding in Haymarket, and both Strathmore and the Bristol Crossing will add additional students to already overcrowded Knoxville School. Um, so I just wanted to bring those three things to the attention to the public. Thank you. Please vote. Oh. Ms. Williams. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. It, I just want to acknowledge all with all of the HVAC repair. Um, I have been very adamant about seeking HVAC repair for our other schools, and I just want to take the opportunity to let you know that your time is coming. We have not forgotten, especially Ripon. I will continue um, to keep those on our radar. These projects were done um, under different financial designations and under different scope, um, but you are not forgotten. So I just want to make sure that I mention that as we proceed. So thank you. Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Ralston, motion passed. Okay, moving on to citizen comment time. Those citizens who've signed up in advance with the clerk may address the school board this evening when they're called to the podium. The citizen comment period for regular school board meetings is one hour and citizens may speak on the agenda items or other topics germane to the operations and policies of Prince William County Schools. Please use proper decorum and manners while at the podium or you will be asked to step aside. We ask that the audience please be respectful of each speaker and refrain from any clapping, cheering or jeering to avoid disruption of the meeting. If you do not do so, the board will recess, and I will ask that the room be cleared to restore public order. Tonight, we have 13 citizens signed up to speak. I will call your name. Please come up to the podium and state your name and address for the record. We'll start with the first five if they want to come up and grab a seat at the front. Lori Willis, Antoinette McDonald, Carl Greeton, Amanda Locklear, and Kimberly Melman Orozco. Lori Willis. Good evening. My name is Lori Willis and my address is on file. I'm here tonight to speak about Regulation 796 and its current impact on school librarians. I am an elementary school librarian and for the last two weeks I have been combing through my collection of 11,000 books looking for any that would meet the criteria in the regulation. This is because on May 24th at 5 p.m. librarians were given the directive to begin this arduous task in order to have a list ready for parents by July 21st, 30 days prior to the start of next school year. Based on the criteria, in the rubric we were given, any type of nudity must be flagged. This means little kid naked bottoms of No David and Iggy Peck Architect go on the list. The other books I've been flagging are about indigenous populations, ancient civilizations like Greece, Rome, and Egypt due to their clothing, and Virginia history books due to our state seal and flag depicting a goddess with her breast exposed. All these books now fall under the category of sexually explicit. While kissing is not on the rubric sent to librarians, nor stated in the regulation, we were told in a Teams chat by a central office staff member that the county lawyer said we need to include these books. Now we are going back to relook at books to make sure we did not miss any first kisses or kisses between parents and grandparents. We as librarians do not disagree that a parent should be notified about instructional materials and the content they contain. In fact, this is already standard practice in the county when it comes to mature topics. Our concern that is that even the author of the state model policy when meeting with library leaders in Virginia explicitly stated that library books were not a part of this policy. School li libraries offer students the opportunity to read a variety of books to find the ones that they like. These books are books they select for themselves. That is not the definition of an instructional material. Additionally, librarians have been left with more questions than answered. answers. We have no, had no norming sessions and no formal training to look at examples or non-examples. Over 100 school librarians have been placed in a team's chat to work things out ourselves before our contracts end on June 16th. This is nearly impossible and unacceptable as we have had to close our libraries to work on this. 
We are being looked on as experts in our buildings simply because we are the ones conducting the work right now. I've heard many classroom teachers say that they will not even have a classroom library next year because they do not have time nor do they understand the types of books that fall into these criteria. Many believe that they are supposed to remove the books from their classroom libraries. In closing, I highly encourage all of you to please visit school libraries in your districts between now and June 15th. Pick one elementary, one middle, one high school and spend 15 minutes talking to librarians. Let us know what happens to our libraries when we don't complete this task in time because it's impossible and we won't. What is the plan going forward? And what are librarians' consequences for failure to complete or failure to identify a book? Will we not be allowed to open sections of our library? I work in a Title I school. Will my already marginalized community fall further behind due to lack of access to book, books? Please, I implore you, visit your school libraries and see the firsthand scope of this work. Thank you. Antoinette McDonald. My name is Antoinette McDonald and my address is on file. Greatest evening, Dr. Latif, school board, Dr. McDade, and our student representative. I come before you as a mom of two Prince William County students, class of 2019 and 2027, a community member, and also the servant principal of Bel Air Elementary School. Commitment one, learning and achievement for all under the world languages section of our strategic plan reads, Currently, the division offers a dual language immersion program at one elementary school. We will add six more dual language immersion programs by 24-25. It is with great pleasure that I highlight the exceptional benefits and share my experience of being the only dual language Spanish immersion program in the division, as well as the importance of the arts when discussing DLI. Our dual language Spanish immersion program has been in full thrive motion for five years and our first cohort of students are headed to fourth grade. With a curriculum that simultaneously teaches proficiency in both English and Spanish, students are given the invaluable opportunity to develop bilingualism and multicultural competency. The advantages of being bilingual are many, including enhanced career opportunities, improved cognitive abilities, and a wider understanding and appreciation of diverse cultures. Our program's success is due to the intellectual property of my DL teachers, our site-based dual language coach and myself. We write curriculum, design pacing, uh, write and implement report cards, design assessments, and restructure our Spanish math instruction for optimal language bridging for the mastery of standards. Furthermore, I believe that access to full-time art and music teachers is a vital component in ensuring student academic success in dual language programs. Art and music programs provide students with a well, what well, we heard, a well-rounded education that nurtures creativity, self-expression, and critical thinking. Studies show that participation in music and arts education is linked to improved academic outcomes, as well as positive personal and social development. The investment in full-time art and music teachers shows a commitment to cultivating academic achievement and fostering global individuals. But however, for the 23-24 school year, we will not have this ability due to the budget structures, but I ask the board to please consider that part-time arts educators and their impact on student learning in the smaller schools. In summary, I remain optimistic about the tremendous benefits that dual language immersion programs offer to all students. I look forward to the recognition in the instructional and fiscal inclusion of Bel Air in the division's expansion of the dual language programs. I hope the board recognizes the essential role of full-time music and art full-time music art teachers for student academic success, especially in the smaller schools. Thank you. Carl Greeton. Good evening. I'm Carl Greeton and I live in the Gainesville District. Prince William County citizens are not happy. During your tenure, all of you up here, the following problems have arisen within the county and school system. Prince William County does not need to hear who is to blame for all our problems. You as a school board need to create and take action to alleviate the problems. These problems are budget increases without substance, failing scores, gender identity, equity over merit, school security, social ideology, school lockdowns, gender mutilation, diversity, inclusion and equity, and indoctrination. We need our school system to teach the basics so that our students can excel in comparison to the rest of the world. 
These are all issues that have increased exponentially in the last two years under Democrat control. Who is sitting on the school board at that time? Just turn your eyes to your left and your right shoulder. You may say that this does not exist in Prince William County, yet you are the same Democrat party in which these do exist in other states and counties. You have had time to correct these wrongs. Now the electorate is speaking up against the Democrat decisions in Prince William County. We can tell you that we have candidates in place to replace you. Chair, Kerry Rist, Brentsville, Erica Trednick, Coles, Stephen Spiker, Gainesville, Jen Wall, Neabsco, Michael Petko, Occoquan, Ryan Kirkpatrick, Potomac, Mario Beckles, and Woodbridge is coming soon. Why would you not listen to the citizens of the county in which you represent? Examine your conscience and do what is right for Prince William County. One issue that is occurring in Prince William County is ludicrous. Why would you rather receive for your hourly pay? Would you rather receive an average of $21.29 or $15.79? You need a college degree for $15.79. The county pays you to learn to drive a bus for $21.29, yet you need to have a college degree in order to be a substitute teacher at $15.79. What position is more important, driving a bus or teaching the students? This needs to change. Do your job, evaluate the issues, make corrections, otherwise we have replacements for your position. Thank you. Amanda Locklear. Good evening, my name is Amanda Locklear. This is interesting because the older I get, the more I appreciate people who are straightforward and clear about their intentions. Morals, character, and values speak loudly. There are a few things that you can't get back in life. The word after it is said, an opportunity after it is missed, and a period of time after it is gone. Time cannot be replaced. Yet not all of us pay attention to it. A few of us rush it. Many of us waste it. Some of us don't have it, and not all of us are promised it. Prince William County Schools is the second largest division in Virginia and the 34th largest in the nation with roughly 90,000 students. 13% of these students have an IEP, which means there's about 11,500 students under the special education umbrella. Now this does not include students on a 504 plan and it does not include students that are receiving early intervention before they are evaluated for special education. The clock is ticking. Early identification is key. We all know the older a child gets, the more difficult it is to teach them how to read. It's my understanding that if a child cannot read by the third grade, odds are that they will never catch up. The effects of this can be devastating. The clock is ticking. The I in IEP stands for individualized. One program, one method, one class will not work for everyone. The clock is ticking. Waiting until the 10th day to finalize and send an IEP for signature, waiting until the 45th day to allow parents to come in and view records after requesting, a, after putting in a FERPA request, waiting until the 60th business day. Out of 65 business days, which in my son's case, was one week shy of three months to conduct and provide reevaluation data to parents, waiting until the 29th day to hold an IEP meeting, et cetera, does nothing to help the child. It reminds me of a childish game about running down the clock, except there are no winners here. The clock is ticking. I challenge you to point your moral compass accordingly. Those of you that are watching, I know you're watching, and I'm talking to you so you can help your team. Actions speak louder than words. Courage is contagious. We cannot go back and change the beginning, but you can start now where you are to change the ending. Thank you. Kimberly Melman Orozco. Good evening. Um, my name is Dr. Kimberly Melman Orozco. My address is on file. Um, last time I was here, I spoke to you all about a whistleblower teacher who contacted me on March 31st and told me about systemic violations to federal and state law affecting children with IEPs. 
I told you I had recordings of those conversations. They were in depth and detail. And the only one of you who reached out to me is Mr. Justin David Wilk. None of you asked to hear those recordings. None of you asked to meet with me except for him. Now, since that meeting on June 1st, the Virginia Department of Education issued a letter of findings. And that letter of findings said, they, we find Prince William County Public Schools has a fundamental misunderstanding of its responsibility to implement IEP accommodations and has systemically denied IEP accommodations to students with disabilities during admissions related testing and auditions to Prince William, Prince William County Public Schools specialty programs. It went on to say it also appears that PWCPS is shifting the burden to parents by requiring parents to in, in, ensure that other PWCS staff are implementing the child's IEP. That's a finding from the Virginia Department of Education. I'm in contact with the US Department of Education. Their letter is forthcoming. After I published this finding on a public Facebook uh, group called Our Schools PWCS, I had an outpouring, an outpouring of parents thanking me and essentially sharing similar stories. One person wrote to me, after reading your posts and scrolling the comments, I'm overwhelmed with emotion because until someone speaks up, you feel all alone fighting for services in this district. No parent should feel that they have to fight the administrators in this county for services for children. It's called a free, appropriate public education. Another parent said, this is amazing. Thank you so much for advocating, not only for your child, but for every child with an IEP. I know it was hard, and it was hard, because each and every one of you, Wade Anderson, Dr. Latanya McDade, each and every one of you knew what was going on for months and did nothing, except for Mr. Wilk. Another parent said, thank you for your advocacy. I know this could not possibly have been easy, but it will undoubtedly make a path a little clearer for many of us who come after you. And it goes on and on and on of parents thanking me. Some parents said, wow, Dr. Kim, with a PhD in criminology, imagine what you can do with four years and an actual platform. You did this in two months. And that's the reason why today, as of today, I am running for chair of this board. I shared this with one of my favorite teachers. She said, oh, Kim, I am so proud that you're stepping up to be on the board. We all need more parents like you who want the best for children and teachers. Thank you. Have a good night. The next five will be Kimberly Stewart, Caroline Rist, Carol Fox, Ken Michelson, Marty Weaver. Kimberly Stewart. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kimberly Stewart. My address is on file. First, I'd like to take a brief moment to give a huge thank you and appreciation for the hard work and all the members at Haymarket Elementary School and Reagan Middle School for providing my children with an incredible school year. We're grateful for the strong community of volunteers, families, teachers, and leadership, among other staff. Tonight, though, I am here to uh, urge the board, which you have, to vote unanimously on the school district's development impact statement uh, with High Point at Haymarket rezoning that states that the school board is opposed to the subject application. This is item 12.14 on the adoption of consent agenda. The high occupancy bill will negatively impact not only the capacity of HE um, at HMES and Reagan Middle School by over 100%, but the area in which the proposed build would exist does not have the proper resources, infrastructure, and support to provide its residents with what they would need. I strongly believe that the numbers are grossly misrepresented by the data that was provided to the county and the true impact of student population. I am not a math teacher. I'm a social studies teacher. But a 244 unit build that would have a minimum 144 multifamily units does not add up properly to the impact of only 25 students to HMES. The assessment states that only 25 students would be added. I believe it's inaccurate to say the least. Our school board in conjunction with our Prince William County government must do a better job of ensuring that any new builds that impact our environment and our children's education must ensure that children are never impacted negatively by those decisions 
No child should have to learn isolated outside a regular school building. No teacher should have to teach separate from the rest of their colleagues. And no board member or county supervisor should ever approve any new construction, rezoning application, or corporate build that would result in overcrowding and overcapacity of our schools. Finally, I would like to comment on 15.01 proposed code of behavior and briefly state that as an educator trained in restorative practices and one who has seen it in action in my own teaching, in my own building, and in my own experience, restorative practices are merely conversations with no consequence. They are not effective. The long-term data proves that they are not effective. Children in our schools need consequences for the behaviors. Conversations help. Conversations lead to better behaviors. But consequences and actions also must be taken to hold children accountable. Thank you. Caroline Rist. All right, good evening, school board member, Superintendent McDade, Chairman Latif. I'm Carrie Riss, Prince William County resident from the Gainesville District, mother of Prince William County school age children. Tonight I'm speaking as a mother and as an advocate for other mothers and parents. And one of the reasons why parental rights and a parent voice is so vital to the success of a child's health and education. But I also speak from a position of success first, a model which I hope and which should be replicated. In our school, my children's elementary school, we have an exceptional working relationship with our teachers, our nurse, and our school administration, which should be the standard across the county. May 14, 2019, day after Mother's Day, I'd just taken my last law school LLM exam, and my youngest, who was five at the time, was rushed by ambulance to Inova Fairfax Children's Hospital, newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Needles, insulin, test strips, and carb counting became our new world, and subsequently became our future schools and all of her, our, her future teachers' new world. We have learned that diabetes management is hard work. It requires effective communication and trust for those who interact with my daughter and provide her care. I stand here today, four years later, as an example of how a child who has special medical needs during school and how we have successfully partnered with our teachers, our nurse, and our administration, and how we daily communicate to deliver the best medical and academic care. I found to be successful, it takes all parties, a teacher voice, a nurse voice, and most importantly, a parent voice. We work together. However, across the county, that is not the standard. And unfortunately, I'm speaking tonight because of friends, neighbors, and strangers who have reached out in frustration. Yes, every family's situation is different. Every child's needs are different. IEPs differ significantly from 504s. But what has been concerning and what needs to change and why parents are pulling their children from our schools is ineffective communication, lack of trust, and disregard for parental rights. Just yesterday, another mom stopped me in the community to share that they're not returning to Prince William County schools because the schools have failed their families with their IEP accommodation process. Over the last years, parents have been told they don't have a say in their children's education, that our children belong to the government, reflective of actions and policies implemented. And I have a problem with those assertions and policies that reflect those statements. I vehemently disagree, and I argue that my daughter's success in school has everything to do with my parental voice. Parents' rights matter. To be successful, we need to have a say and to be involved in our child's education. Thank you. Carol Fox. Carol Fox. Okay, next, Ken Michelson. Dr. Latif, members of the board, Dr. McDade. My name is Ken Michelson, and I'm the uh, president of Prince William Crew Association. So I'm here to talk to you about one thing right off the bat that's not going to cost you any money, believe it or not, and it's not a complaint. No money, no complaint. Um, I'm asking in the interest of fairness, accessibility, and inclusiveness 
that we actually have in the five schools in, within the county that don't currently have rowing programs in which we are funding coaches' salaries to fill those positions, that we start programs in those schools. It provides a great opportunity for those that are not members of or have functioned in traditional sports, the, act, the capability of getting into the sport, um, as well as I've had those conversations with members of the AD's office, and they're in full support of it as well for those schools that have it. What we need to do is figure out why those five schools that currently are being provided salaries to hire coaches are not doing so. My organization is, has an MOU uh, arrangement with the County Board of Supervisors. What we do is we oversee, we manage, we provide the maintenance, and we also do the promotion of the sport within the community as well as within the school systems in those activities in those schools that support crew. 170 schools on the women's side provide scholarship for women at the college level. Those scholarships can be fractionalized, so they're not like football or basketball or any of those other sports. They can be fractionalized down to a tenth. This provides an opportunity for some of our students who aren't six foot four basketball players, who might be a five foot 100 pound coxswain, to gain a scholarship, further their education that may not have been provided to them in any other sport. All right? Part of that's also going to rely on some reliable transportation to get younger students to the boathouse. The other point is in our community, we have multiple different swimming pools with swimming lanes. We have golf courses, which are the other two sports that don't have on-site facilities. We have a single boathouse in the county. It's in Lake Ridge Park. We have battlefield parents that are traveling 45 minutes to an hour, one way to get their kids to practice, a two-hour practice and an hour back home. I have currently one member who's saying that their state qualifying boat, third place that states, will lose half of its membership because they are freshmen, they can't drive, and they can't get to practice next year. Please help me with some of these problems. I'll work with the ADs and the schools, and we'll move forward. Thank you. Marty Weaver. Marty Weaver, Occoquan. This situation is just so profoundly wrong. Let's start with science. My science degree included genetics and psychology. My husband and I had our DNA tested. He's male, XY. I'm female, XX. I had an amniocentesis when I was pregnant. Those results showed XY chromosomes, a boy. They did not tell me that I would have to wait until my child could talk to tell me how he identified. In abnormal psychology, there's an example of a young man who believed himself to be a cow. Nothing could dissuade him until he was told, okay, that would be, he would be fattened and slaughtered. He no longer identified as a cow. Someone can imitate nature, but can't change it. No amount of surgery, hormones, or drugs can change what I am. DNA remains in control, and no one can change time. But my troubled brain might have me identify as a 21-year-old, five foot tall, thin Japanese male. Despite DNA, birth certificate, 50-year marriage, 39-year-old son in a mirror, all that tell me otherwise, but I can't see it. Just like an anorexic who looks in a mirror and still sees fat. So at a time when we all should be providing stability to our kids going through normal changes, you are sowing confusion, encouraging confusion, by telling them that they can be whatever sex they want when they really can't. While we hear about increasing rates of mental health issues, suicidal thoughts and actions in our 8 to 10-year-olds, what are you doing? One third of our kids can't read at grade level, but you all find the time to fill their heads with 31 flavors of crazy or harm. Last month was mental health awareness, not celebration. We should not celebrate or be proud this month that there are kids and adults who are suffering, being harmed with gender-affirming care. 
And we should exercise compassion, but compassion is extending sympathy, assistance to all, to aid their thriving in reality. Compassion is absolutely not validating delusions of a few, and worse, demanding the rest of us assist in propping up the delusions. And now you threaten and punish kids, parents, teachers who don't conform to the delusions, who don't use someone's revised pronouns, made up pronouns. Who has really got the problem here? People who have recognized the obvious for millennia, or a small segment who really needs help? I feel like we are in a story arc of Star Trek featuring the Borg. Our nation's vulnerable are being assimilated into a maladaptive world, the hive mentality, a social contagion spread by social media and schools. I will not be assimilated. Don't like sci-fi? How about the childhood story of the emperor's new clothes? Society now normalizes is troubled. Awards are given to males over biofemales. Cycling track swimming. Do you have the courage to sever the connection to the board collective or recognize the emperor has no clothes? Do no harm. Protect the kids. Protect us all. Have thriving futures. Next, we'll have the last three, Jennifer Roberts, Alicia Fauser, and Jalen Custis. Jennifer Roberts. Good evening, Dr. McDade, Dr. Latif, school board members, and Prince William County school leaders. My name is Jennifer Roberts. I reside in the Gainesville district, and my address is on file. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight about the district's commitment to organizational coherence, particularly Objective 4.4, which states that PWCS will work toward convergence, operating a unified school system with shared accountability for school and division goals. To paraphrase Matthew 12, 25, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Our district is a type of house, and sadly, it remains divided, which is hurting students and families. I know firsthand that we employ team members at every level of leadership who are dedicated to the mission of launching thriving futures for all PWCS students. However, I also know firsthand that we employ leaders who are sabotaging this goal far too often in plain sight with no concern for being held accountable. These bad actors can be hard to spot because most predatory educators are not arrogant enough to publicly say, I have no intention of serving all of the students in my sphere of influence equitably but daily they close their classroom and office doors and deny students the relationships, emotional safety, and educational resources that they need to be successful. Examples include, but are not limited to, teachers who do not implement district-provided equity training, teachers who knowingly abuse the standards-based grading policy, teachers who use humiliation and sarcasm towards students as ways to establish or maintain power, staff members who do not apply discipline policies equitably, guidance counselors and teachers who discourage students from taking advanced placement or dual enrollment classes by convincing students that classes will be too difficult, and administrators who refuse to work with staff members and parents to address and resolve climate and culture concerns at their school. It is our students who pay the highest cost when leaders refuse to act purposefully, courageously, and swiftly to hold these offenders accountable and to document out staff members who show that they do not want to serve all students. There should always be room for healthy doses of grace in any organization for team members who show evidence of working to meet the expectations but there should be no room for offenders who willfully impose their personal preferences on students instead of following the district's established regulations and policies. Thank you. Alicia Fauser. Alicia G. Fauser. Okay, Jalen Custis. Uh, hello, good evening. My name is Jalen Custis. I reside in the Woodbridge District, and I'm here to advocate to bring back uh, paper learning. Uh, I don't know who created the policy to implement computers inside our schools. I believe it was a good idea, obviously, for COVID. But once we got back into school, we had the struggles of use doing work online. 
Uh, all your work's on Canvas, so if your computer goes out, you're done. And that seems to be a lot of problems and a lot of issues with students. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it in action. I believe the only people I've seen in action is student representatives. And I don't know if they've told you the struggles that happen inside our schools when it comes to uh, the computer work. People forget their, to charge their computers, then you have cords all over the classrooms, with, which causes, a, um, what is it, a tripping hazard. We need to go back to doing it how we used to do it, because that's the best way, and it's solid, and you know what's gonna happen, because it's, anything can happen with a computer. I remember my uh, one student, my former classmate, she told me she had to take a final exam, and obviously there's a lot of time for the, for the exam, and her computer went out. And the teacher said, well, just wait for the computer to come back on. The computer finally came on. She had a lot of time, but the time was up. Therefore, she couldn't complete her final exam. Uh, again, I believe that we have to either improve this policy or just go back to what was working from the beginning. I've been the last two years on computer, and it seems to be a struggle, at least for me personally. Uh, again, there's a lot of issues going on, and so yeah. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Jalen Cusses, and I reside in the Woodbridge District. Okay. Now we'll move on. So um, if there's no objection from the board, I have, um, I'd like to make an uh, um, adjustment to the, the order here. We have student representative time. I'd like to move up ahead now of 14, which is the Energy Management Sustainability Update, and ahead of the um, superintendent services. Is there any objection to doing that? I have the students. Some of them have to go for graduation stuff. Okay, um, so at this time, without any objection, we'll move on to the student representative time. And tonight we have two student reps and our alternate student representative with us. All three are seniors. And tonight is their last meeting. We are proud of their accomplishment and successes this year. And we'll give each of them time to address the board tonight. When I call your name, please step up to the podium. First, and we, he's already up here, is Mr. Chance Williams, a senior from Forest Park High School who graduated on June 4th. And so he's done. And joining us tonight on the dais, this is overtime for him. Chance will be attending Alabama A&M next year. Congratulations, Chance. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Well, he already said it, but good evening. Um, this past Sunday, Dr. Latif, Dr. McDade, Ms. Williams, Mr. Wilk, and of course, Ms. Jesse got to witness me walk the stage and become a graduate of Prince William County Public Schools. I genuinely believe that PWCS prepared me accurately for what comes next. I look forward to enjoying my summer before continuing my education at Alabama A&M University in Huntsville, Alabama. Thanks to my education and numerous opportunities at Prince William County, I was able to earn two academic scholarships, meaning I will graduate with little to no student debt. I would like to thank the board for the numerous conversations and the appreciation you've shown your student representatives. From the various football games where I often ran into Mr. Wilk to the robotics competitions that I'm so glad all of our school board members have invested in. One of my goals when I was first elected as student representative was to have an independent conversation with each board member. I believe that at this point I have finally achieved that. <laughs> talking with Ms. Wall at FRC competitions, talking with Ms. Zargapur at the Suicide Awareness Walk, seeing Ms. Jackson at nearly everything, same with Mr. <laughs> Wilk, and of course speaking with Dr. Latif wherever he may be found. I've kept many of the notes I've gained, including one from Ms. Jesse, where she told me I have it. I would like to acknowledge my overwhelming appreciation for Ms. Lee Jesse. Ms. Jesse has probably been one of my greatest supporters, helping me become more comfortable with my college choice and with my family as we continuously support my sister. I would also like to thank Ms. Lori Williams for her support of me and the robotics program and for helping me feel welcomed here on this board. Though we are not technically related, though we share the last name Williams, I'm happy to consider you family. Of course, Dr. McDade has been overwhelmingly supportive and has quickly become a county favorite. <clears throat> Where was I? Being a student representative has been one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life and has led to make me making numerous connections and achievements. This was my first experience with public speaking. Needless to say, I am grateful for my time on this board, grateful for the education I received from PWCS, and I look forward to returning during my breaks. That's all. Next, we have Danya Sharifi, senior from Gainesville High School, who will graduate on June 13th. 
and Danya will be attending Yale University next year. Congratulations, Danya. And Danya has the the privilege of maybe maybe one uh, the second person that I remember of being having served two years as a school board representative and two of the toughest years probably you know in the most recent American school board history. <laughs> so you know, Danya, we we appreciate everything you were with us for the last two years with us through everything, and we can't thank you enough for the the support you've given and the way you've represented our students over these last two years. They really owe you a debt, a great debt. Thank you. Danya. Hey, good evening to the Prince William County School community, school board chairman Latif and Dr. McDade. Tonight is my last night as student representative within this county and I am so grateful again for the opportunity to speak to you one last time. Uh, sophomore year when I first learned about this position and I applied to be student representative, I hadn't really known about what the role really consisted of, um, just that it would be a great way to give back to the community I've been involved in since kindergarten, first taking my first steps onto the school bus. Um, by the end of the sophomore year, I was watching the school board meeting on a live stream when I found out that I would have the opportunity to serve as student representative. Um, through that year, um, my first junior year as student representative, I learned so much about what it means to be the student voice, along with the inner workings of the public educational system. Low and growing alongside with the other representatives from last year, Charlotte and McLeet, um, was an amazing experience. I decided to apply again at the end of junior year and was grateful to be able to serve a second term my senior year. As the year went by, I continuously learned more and worked alongside with this year's reps, Chance and Christian, um, and I'm excited for the future reps that will be announced later tonight, as this has been an amazing experience that helped me learn more about my career and educational goals as it aligns with government, education, and public policy. I also love the collaboration opportunities with the Student Senate, and for the future, I hope there will be more opportunities for students to get involved in such opportunities as I have participated in as my time as a student representative. From leadership conference to committee voice planning to overseeing different initiatives, I wish the best of luck to our future representatives. Thank you to the school board for the opportunities, um, Chairman Latif for the continued support, and Dr. McDade for conversations about women in leadership. And thank you to Mr. Gervin and Mrs. Viola for being the best mentors these past two years and being the liaison between the school board and Ms. B. Um, I'm so grateful to have worked alongside such amazing peers, and thank you again to Charlotte McLeet, um, Chance and Christian, and the Student Senate. You guys continuously inspire me as well. I look forward to seeing how our students thrive in the future and how the future reps will go around bringing their voice. Thank you all and have a good rest of your night. Very good, Danya. I think we're all gonna miss you very much. Um, Moving on to our last student, and what just happened to my script here? Where, where? Oh, got it, right, right sorry, so sorry. Um, and now we have our alternate student representative, Christian Daniels. Christian is a senior from the Hilton High School who graduates on June 10th, and he will be attending Yale as well. Congratulations, Christian. Thank you, thank you. Hello, okay. <laughs> So good evening to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, congratulations to both our Prince William County students and staff on completing the 2022 to 2023 school year. Uh, to begin, I would like to give a big shout out to all the educators across the county. Our Prince William County staff has worked so diligently to strengthen uh, knowledge within our student body, which uh, need celebration. Uh, in addition, I would like to congratulate all class of 2023 graduates for persevering through our barriers that were faced during the most recent years, most notably COVID-19. Secondly, I would like to thank you all for having me as your alternate student representative this year. I was able to work with the senators on special tasks like the Student Bill of Rights, Student Voice Committees, and leadership conferences. Throughout my past two years as a senator and student representative, I have had the outstanding opportunity to have been surrounded by other change-focused youth like Chance, Danya, McLeet, um, and more. And amazing advisors that have been critical to my leadership, teamwork, and communication skills. Going into the school year, this, the rest of the student representatives and I were focused on uh, strengthening and working on enhanced inclusivity, educational, extra 
curricular opportunities and student voice in Prince William County. This year, we were able to more effectively work with the Student Senate in making sure these goals were achieved. After various meetings with the Student Senate and feedback from other students regarding these topics, it is certain that the great advances were made, whether that be the expansion of cultural clubs, uh, projects surrounding equity, leadership events, or other general student forums uh, within the, the county. I want to continue encouraging students to bring their viewpoints to areas of higher authority to share their thoughts on how they think our school community can be improved with other students. Through this, we will begin to see changes that can meet the needs of our student body. Once again, thank you all so much for having me as your alternate student representative for this year. Uh, I have enjoyed my two-year tenure as first a uh, student senator and a student representative. Thank you all so much. Uh, so, so the the board's asking me. We're going to take a picture with you three before we leave. Okay, so um, so we will we'll do that. And 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 Christian, I I I didn't mention. You know, and I'm glad you reminded us the importance of the student senate. Um, this student senate worked with Dr. McDade to put together our strategic plan as well. And I think that's really important to know. You guys have been a model for what I believe has been great um, student self governance and governance by students. Um, uh, of any sc large school division in the country, and the great work you continue to do helps continue build up our student voice, and we can't thank you enough for the efforts you've done, and again, through some of the toughest times to be involved in, um, uh, in education and education policy. Thank you very much. I invite you three to, um, uh, and your families to join us up front here for a picture with Dr. McDade and the school board, and, and I have, I think, uh, someone to take a picture. And we have some gifts for you as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. That is um, just a um, great way to um, sort of wrap up our school year with those amazing students. We can't thank them enough. Again, um, okay, let's move on to, uh, we'll go back to 14, 1401, Energy Management Sustainability Program Update. I'll turn this over to Dr. McDade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, providing a positive climate and culture is outlined in commitment two of our strategic plan, which exemplifies a dedication to creating an environment for our community to learn, lead, and live. And so as a part of positive climate and culture, it's not just about, um, you know, uh, safety for students, 
um, welcoming environments for students. It's also about sustainable environments. And so we're committed to creating safe, welcoming, and sustainable facilities for our students and staff. So at this time, I do want to invite our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Vernon Bach, to present an update on the sustainability efforts of the division. You know that we have a Superintendent's Advisory Council on sustainability and they have been hard at work every year. They have recommendations that they bring forward and um, they'll be presenting some of their recommendations this evening. Mr. Bach. Uh, thank you, Dr. McDade. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Latif, board members. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and I'm really excited to be a part of the division that is so, so forward thinking and uh, progressive with issues like energy management and sustainability. Um, we have uh, folks here with us tonight. In fact, we have the whole team. We have nine team members uh, who are also in the audience here from the entire energy management and sustainability team. And I don't want to steal too much of their thunder, but these nine folks have saved the division $70 million since 2013. Yes, small but mighty, $70 million. Uh, and some of our folks are behind me here in the audience, so I want to thank them. And so we're here tonight. Obviously, the board passed a resolution for division-wide sustainability initiative. And our strategic plan includes sustainability goals, incorporating environmental literacy, using the building as a teaching tool, redu reducing greenhouse gases with high-performance construction and maintenance strategies. We have Jess Weimer here tonight, our coordinator and program analyst for energy and sustainability, as well as Don Richardson, our chair of the Superintendent's Advisory Council on Sustainability, uh, who will provide the board with progress updates for our energy management and sustainability efforts in the division. The presentation, presentation uh, will highlight an overview of three concepts tonight, energy and environmental sustainability education, high performance facilities, and community engagement. With a focus on these three concepts, Prince William County will be on the path to division-wide sustainability and beyond. And with that, I'd like to invite Jess Weimer to please uh, join me here at the lectern to present. So thank you. Oh, okay. Hello, just waiting for the clicker. Thank you so much. I'm just going to go back one. All right, good evening, Dr. Latif, Vice Chair Wall, members of the school board, and Dr. McDade. Mr. Bach, thank you for the introduction. My name is Jessica Weimer, and I am one of the Energy and Sustainability Coordinators in the Facilities Department. On behalf of my team, who is all here this evening, I will be providing you with our annual program update and highlight the achievements and progress the division has made this year as we continue down the path to sustainability. So it has been over 10 years since the energy management program began. And in the beginning, our focus was really on reducing energy consumption, increasing our energy efficiencies, and reducing division-wide utility costs. So this effort helped the division return those cost savings back to schools and classrooms. And in the last three years, our program has really expanded to include sustainability. And we sincerely appreciate the board's support with the passing of the sustainability initiative in June 2020, so just a few years ago, and to Dr. McDade and her vision for a more sustainable school division and including sustainability in the strategic plan. And speaking of the strategic plan, energy and sustainability falls under commitment to positive climate and culture. So here we have four goals pertaining to sustainability. And together we can really use these goals as sort of a navigational compass as we make progress in the areas of environmental literacy, using the building as a teaching tool, and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So our team often refers to sustainability in terms of a pathway, or in this instance, a trail. And there are three key stops along the way and they are sustainability education, high performance facilities, and community engagement, all leading us toward sustainability. So first stop is education, and we are in the final stages of developing a division-wide environmental literacy plan that includes a crosswalk of cross-curricular standards and professional development opportunities for teachers and staff. 
So a resource that has evolved from the development of the Environmental Literacy Plan is the School Sustainability Measures Profile. So each school has their own unique profile that includes site-specific data, such as waste reduction, energy performance, and even local watershed info. So continuing in education, here we have captured some ways that schools have access to and are currently participating in our program. My team has created a series of original activity books for all grade levels. And then we have about two thirds of our schools currently participating in our annual energy challenge, which is the program where schools can earn incentives for their contributions to division-wide energy conservation. Next, we have developed a series of Canvas modules for both students and staff with project-based learning opportunities embedded throughout those modules. And finally, all schools participate in some form of waste reduction and recycling. And last point in education, and certainly not least, and a fantastic example of how a school can use their building as a teaching tool, Freedom High School was recently recognized as a green ribbon school. And we do have with us this evening Dr. Jessica Duaron from Freedom High School. And so Freedom earned this recognition for their efforts in environmental stewardship, improved health and wellness, and environmental and sustainability education. So they will be honored this summer, I believe it's early August, by the US Department of Education in a ceremony. Our second stop along the way brings us to high performance facilities. As we have been doing for many years, we have four seasonal shutdowns for the purpose of helping save energy over long breaks. And we are currently preparing for our summer break shutdown now. And these shutdowns are really a fantastic opportunity for students and staff to become involved in our division-wide energy conservation efforts. So moving along in the high performance facilities stop, we are continuing with our energy infrastructure upgrades, and this includes things like our LED lighting projects throughout the division. We also have an upcoming geothermal HVAC renovation at Bel Air Elementary School. Also, we have been updating the sustainable design principles for new construction and major renovations, and these updates have led to some high performance projects. So just to highlight a couple here, first we have the solar PPA, where we are in the design phase now, we are estimating that construction will begin later this summer. And then for the net zero replacement for Occoquan Elementary School, we are finalizing the design for county permitting now. And finally, we are deploying something called ARC, which is a building performance dashboard for all schools that can be used by the schools as a cross-curricular teaching tool. So here we have a snapshot of sustainability statistics and as you can see, and as Mr. Bach mentioned earlier, in the last 10 years, we've saved over $70 million in would-be energy costs. And all of the other values listed here are for this particular fiscal year, FY23, and are a result of all of the energy conservation measures that we have put in place to reduce our energy cost per student and usage per square foot. All while we continue to reduce our environmental impact by decreasing our emissions, and by increasing our waste reduction efforts. So all of these measures are moving us closer towards our sustainability goals. And the third stop on the sustainability trail is community engagement. And the Superintendent's Advisory Council on Sustainability has played a major role in these efforts. At this time, I would like to introduce the SACS Chairman, Mr. Don Richardson. Mr. Richardson has provided steadfast leadership for the council over the last three years. We appreciate his and all of the council's efforts to provide recommendations for the division's continued growth and sustainability. And Mr. Richardson will be providing the annual report on behalf of the council this evening. And after he speaks, I will come back up and share the next steps for the division's energy and sustainability program. Well, good evening, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be back here again. It's been a, uh, been a uh, very productive year once again for the Advisory Council. Uh, we've done a lot of studying about various topics related to sustainability. Uh, we continue to gain new knowledge about uh, emerging technologies and 
uh, different strategies that we could be uh, deploying in the future. Uh, but we, uh, we want to come to you not with a huge laundry list, but with a focused list of high what we agree are high priority recommendations for your consideration uh, with the superintendent for future, uh, for this year anyway. Um, and the first one uh, is to uh, provide funding for staffing to support environmental literacy and waste reduction and recycling. Uh, to break that out a little bit, uh, we have a position for environmental literacy coordinator uh, that uh, is grant funded through FY24 and we are asking you to uh, fund that position beginning in FY25. Uh, the other one is a, a waste reduction and recycling specialist um, to do a comprehensive audit of waste and uh, each facility's waste characterization, standardize the collection process and give some professional development to custodial and support staff on the waste reduction and recycling process. As you noted from the earlier slide, we've already made great strides in reducing the waste stream and a person to coordinate that effort could make that go even farther across uh, the school division. Uh, a second recommendation we're, we're making is, uh, and the background to this is that traditionally the school board has uh, done prototyped school designs that are used repeatedly with tweaks at different sites. Uh, the Sustainability Council would like you to consider the possibility of going to uh, site-specific design for new constructions rather than prototypes. The reason for this, and we spent a lot of time talking about this uh, in the council, is that uh, each site is going to be different in terms of uh, how you orient the building and how you design the building for maximum sustainability. Uh, so uh, we think, we think there, there needs to be some emphasis on looking at each site uh, individually when you do designs. That's something you know, for you to consider with the superintendent. Um, the third item is, uh, and we, it was mentioned earlier that uh, Bel Air is getting a, a, uh, an HVAC upgrade that's going to include geothermal. Uh, we're excited about geothermal because geothermal is uh, one, one underappreciated uh, way to achieve sustainability in your energy management. And so we're recommending that uh, you look at all the sites in the CIP to see if they're feasible for geothermal. Not all of them will be, uh, but many of them may be. And uh, so that is something to, to, uh, to consider. Geothermal has the advantage of being hidden. It's out of sight. Uh, it's always available whether it's sunny or dark. It's always available whether it's windy or not. Uh, so that is definitely something we ought to look at for the future. Um, the next item is uh, evaluating the feasibility of replacing your fleet vehicles with electric models. Now we're not talking about school buses. Uh, the technology is probably not there yet to be uh, financially feasible for us to do that. Uh, but we are looking at the notion that your fleet vehicles uh, would be a place to start uh, to move to electric models, um, and while you're at it, uh, look at uh, the sites around PWCS where you could uh, install uh, EV charging stations to go with that. Uh, the one example that we had as a pilot possibility was to look at your courier fleet. Uh, and I, I remember vividly from my days on this board back when we were still very paper-based, and a courier had to come all the way out to my house, which is near Bull Run Mountain, uh, twice a week to deliver a huge stack of paper. And uh, so the couriers have to go all over the county and it's a big county. So uh, you could make a significant impact right there if you could go to electric vehicles just for the courier fleet. Um, the last two uh, are related to uh, walkability and bikeability. Uh, this is an area where we are already beginning to work with the county. Uh, the Joint Environmental Task Force uh, has expressed interest in working with us to, uh, to make walkability and bikeability to school part of the overall county strategy. Uh, and so we are recommending that you do a study of walking boundaries to find where the barriers to walkability and bikeability are uh, and share that information uh, with our representatives on the Joint Environmental Task Force uh, as their counterparts from the county side are also interested in working with us on that and they'd like us to provide us with some information to inform their planning. Uh, and then the final thing is to uh, and again, you passed uh, several uh, impact statements tonight about various rezoning proposals, and we would like to emphasize that if you're not already doing it, uh, anytime you do a rezoning proposal evaluation, that part of that analysis include 
the impact on walkability and bikeability, whether positive or negative, of the proposed rezoning. And there will be, in certain parts of the county, there will be some negative impacts. So that's just something for you to look at. Um, going to next year, uh, we are gonna continue to advocate for staffing and infrastructure upgrades uh, as funds permit. Uh, this is the big one. Uh, we're going to try to develop a plan for uh, community engagement, get this, the advisory council out talking to people in the community, letting them know what is it we're doing and why is it important and what are their ideas. Uh, we are also going to continue to uh, look at emerging, emerging uh, energy technology and sustainability topics. It's going to be a matter of continuous education for all of us. And finally, we're excited to be in on the process of the net zero design for the Occoquan Elementary Replacement, which is going to be our first uh, net zero ready school. Uh, so that's something that the uh, Advisory Council is intensely interested in following. So it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's been a, a productive year. Um, and before I step away, I would like to thank, if we have any, whoa, <laughs> if we have any members of the Advisory Council here and also the staff, the folks who are sitting toward the back of the room, I can't think, I can't thank all of them enough for the work they do. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been very educational for me personally over the last three years. I've learned a lot about an area that I didn't know a lot about. And uh, the, the council and the staff have been able to work together remarkably well. And I think they deserve a lot of recognition for that. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. McDade and, and uh, Dr. Latif and the board for having given me this opportunity uh, for the last three years. It doesn't seem like three years have gone by that quickly, but they have. Um, it's been very, very satisfying for me personally. However, having said that, um, this past year, I've taken on significant additional responsibilities and leadership in two other organizations, um, and I need to rebalance my life. And so uh, at this point, it's time for me to step aside and let someone else drive the train. But I do appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to serve, and I will certainly be keeping an eye on what's going on going forward. Thank you. Wow. Very good. Well, Mr. Richardson, I, uh, I, I, that's a shock to me. No one warned me about that. Um, so I'll, I'll bring you up for some questions here in a few minutes. But let, since we have Ms. Weimer, Ms. Weimer, I, you know, just what a great um, presentation tonight. I'm, I'm going to start with a couple questions if no one... Oh, you're not done. I'm sorry. Do your just, last slide. Just one more slide, got it, I promise. Got it. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, we just want to thank Mr. Richardson, and we will certainly miss him being part of the council, and we are extremely grateful for his time and leadership that has surely set us up for continued success in the future. So as my team and SACS look into the future, our goal, of course, is to move closer to sustainability. And our focus will continue to be in those three key areas that we've been discussing here this evening. And so for the coming year in environmental literacy, we will be distributing and implementing the environmental literacy plan. We will be continuing to expand participation in our educational initiatives and identifying and exploring ways to realize goals for our infrastructure. And the progress that has been shared this evening happened because of our collective efforts as a division and community. And much has been made possible because of the time, dedication, and expertise of the outstanding group of people that I get to work with every day. At this time, I would like to acknowledge and thank all of the members of the Energy and Sustainability team, all of our school sustainability liaisons who work with us every day to um, encourage sustainability in their schools. And we are extremely proud to serve and support our students, staff, and community in all things energy, sustainability, and beyond. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present our program update to you this evening. We appreciate your guidance and support as we continue down the path to sustainability. That's it. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Jessica Weimer, I, I can't thank you enough. This was an excellent presentation you and Don put together this evening. Um, you know, the first of all, I hope Communications shares this, this widely. This is a great presentation, great slide deck. You know, so many of our students are, are graduating and telling me they're going to go on to study environmental science, sustainability. Um, you know, environmental engineering, and so, you know, it has become a part of everything we do, and, and the way you all have woven it into the work we do at every aspect of the division, 
the way we, you've broken up the committees and the structures to study this and the recommendations you make. I, I for one, will take the recommendations by the council very seriously um, in, in, in what your office has recommended. I, you know, at looking through the slide deck, you know, uh, things that pop up at me, 58 schools participated in FY23's annual energy challenge. That is fantastic. Um, you guys are getting in with the students with so many different project, uh, projects and learning experiences. Uh, Freedom High School recognizes 2023 honoree. Uh, tremendous work you all have done. Um, it is, you know, I, I, I can't thank you all enough. Your office, your team, um, you do it. You do it with a small staff and you do it really, um, we, we, can't, we can't thank you enough. And I, I, for one, am just very proud of this work. Um, and, and so thank you, Jessica. Uh, one thing you, that Dr. I would Dr. ask, um, it, it, well, two things. So I know you, and I may have asked Vern, Vern Bach this question was, you know, I know on the slide you said we have $70 million in savings since 2013. Uh, in, and I can't remember if we've done this. Do, do we have a prediction of how much we're going to save with our sustainability initiatives sort of like predicted over the next five years? Do we do that? Did we do that? We certainly do forecast, yeah. but we also average about five to six million in savings a year. Right. However, with the new initiatives, especially once we start to realize um, savings data and also emissions data from some of our things like our solar and things of that nature, we do anticipate that to go up every year. Wonderful. And then the last thing, just uh, I know in the in the slide deck you you talked about we're on tr we're on track to meet our our net zero commitment or sustainability goals, correct? Or yes. Getting there. <laughs> Maybe, and, and I don't know if we have this, and if you can point out, do we have a dashboard that says how far we've come, where we're going, how much more we need to do on that? I mean, do we, like carbon, you know, footprint, that kind of stuff. Do, we, do you guys have a dashboard? Yes, I'd like to invite my colleague, Brian Conrad, to come up. He would be happy to answer some of those questions. All right, Brian Conrad. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that Justin mentioned was the ARC dashboard for all the individual schools. Um, that will show it each individual through waste, water, um, so our energy side of things. Yeah. It also will show it on um, uh, energy and transportation and human experience or indoor air quality. That will be rolled up for every single, for each individual school and then rolled up together collectively for the entire division. So that will be something that everybody at the school and in our office, we'll be able to um, keep live and updated so everybody is aware. Okay, that's great. That, that's wonderful. May, maybe we can take a look at something like that the next time you make a presentation? Or if Absolutely. A it's yeah. a very interactive dashboard, okay. and the interface is, is very unique Fantastic. and easy to read. Yeah, or send us the link so we can, we, I can take a look at it. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Richardson, I, I, I think, you know, this board, I can speak maybe for them. I... I, I I, I can on this. We, we are grateful for your service for the last three years on top of your distinguished service sitting up on this dais with this school board for many years and doing some of the great work in some of the most difficult and the highest growth periods of Prince William County school history. Um, and then you've come back to help us deal with some of the greatest challenges our society faces. And you've done it with um, poise, with elegance, and with a commitment to working with all aspects of everyone in our community. And, and I hope you remain engaged to help counsel our next chair, our next leaders in this committee as we move forward with still some, some very difficult things we have to do. Oh, well, I thank you. I thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. And uh, I certainly will be engaged. Uh, whoever takes my place, I'll be, I'll be working closely with them uh, to do a, a good, clean pass down. And I'm definitely not losing interest in the subject. I'm definitely going to uh, stay involved uh, watching what's going on. Uh, there is still a lot of work to do, but the good news is that now that we have the Joint Environmental Task Force set up with the county, uh, and now that the county has its people in place uh, staff-wise to move their sustainability initiatives forward, things are starting to move. And they've already identified uh, Dr. Dr. Ernie Porta is our representative on the JET, and he's actually the chairman of the JET. Uh, so he is, uh, he is driving uh, things forward, and uh, there is already some substantial agreement as to what they would like to tackle first. So I'm very encouraged because that's something we've been pushing for since the very beginning, was to get us on board with the county and working together. So it's, the future is bright. Wonderful, Mr. Richard. We really appreciate it. And, 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 and the last question I have for you is, you know, you've served on this board 
and then you've served the last three years, and, and it sounds like you feel like over the last three years we have made a difference. I mean, what do you think? I mean, you know. It's specifically about sustainability. Sustainability, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I can't talk to all those other <laughs> no, issues. No, I'm not, not going to ask you to talk about CRT, okay? No, you no, just no, talk no, about I'm, sustainability. I'm, there, there are days when I miss being on the school board, but generally, no. Um, all right. <laughs> you, guys, you guys have your own challenges to yeah. deal with. Um, as far as sustainability is concerned, though, uh, I came into this uh, more because staff knew that I, I like to run a meeting. Uh, but I definitely am not the brightest person on the advisory council in terms of sustainability issues. Uh, I have learned so much from working with the other people on the council who all bring their own expertise one way or the other and also working with staff. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount. So I guess that's uh, my motivation is it's, it's nice to be involved with something where you're learning something new. And, you know, you should go throughout your life always trying to learn something new. And uh, so that's, that to me is the rewarding part. Um, but it also gives me an excuse to come down here once in a while and, <laughs> and watch you from the back. You're right. Well, we can't thank you enough. This board voted on this initiative and to set up this program three years ago or three and a half years ago. And you have uh, delivered um, on the, um, the promise that we, 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 we have tried, we've tried to make to this community and to the school division. You have validated much of the, the work we believe that needs to be done, and, and you've done it with credibility, uh, fidelity, and, and a commitment and a passion that, that, I, that I hope we can continue once you um, take it, your time it, it off. Will, it will go forward. It's a great team of people. They're, they're going to carry this forward. We're, we're on the roll now. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jesse. Uh, one, I, I, you know, I've known you for quite some time. I was not on the board with you. I've been on the board with everyone else. I've been here for so long, <laughs> not such a long period of time, but I admire the work that you've done. I want to thank you. Uh, Mr. Bach, you know the question I'm going to ask. I, I don't, but I'm <laughs> Yes, you do. Uh, oh, I think I do, actually. Yeah. I think I do. Uh, I think, uh, I, I won't say that I know n net zero about net zero, but I do think that as a person in this, uh, who ha will have a school, the first net zero school in the county, and on slide 10, you talk about feedback for the aquaquan replacement. The people in my community, I'm sure, would like to know more about the school can we develop, can you get back with me with a plan of action? Yes, ma'am. Actually, we, we've had conversations and we're prepared to present an update to the board in September uh, on the design, where we are with things. I, I will share with you, Ms. Jesse, it's been an amazing journey. This team has been heavily involved, but there have been a lot of design meetings with certain stakeholder groups, including yeah. students, faculty, staff, and community. And so we're, we're excited to present an update and we're preparing to present that update in September to you and the rest of the board. Yeah, can I have a personal update, please? Sure. I need a personal update before September. Okay, happy. Thank you. Happy to do it. And I also, the uh, incentive plan that you have in the schools, that money is coming back to individual schools, that program is still in place, I read in the uh, your slides. That's great. Yes, we had 58 schools participate this year. Is there, when, when you say you've got, we've re received $70 million in, uh, savings is that is that money targeted for anything in the school system in the budget I know that sounds like a question that's maybe yeah I don't I don't think we have that targeted I'm gonna defer to mr. Wallingford on that I, I think that that we realize that savings every year um, I'm not sure that that savings then gets targeted uh, but I'm, I'm gonna defer to mr. Wallingford here thank you mr. Bach so there's two things to take place one is uh, there's something called cost avoidance, and so we're avoiding increased costs that we would otherwise experience. That's the first thing. The second thing, there actually is a reduction in cost as well, and so there is a cash savings, cash that we actually realize in our bank accounts. That number is not $70 million. Honestly, I don't know, know what that number is standing here right now. What happens is on a on an incremental basis each year when we build our budgets. We take a look at our utility costs, and when we see those numbers decreasing, that gets built back into the budget. So what you see is costs that might have been spent on fuel or other utilities is now getting spent on teachers or other uh, curricular instructional kinds of issues. 
in getting back with you, Mr. Bach, uh, I just want to have a, maybe just something when people in my community say, what does net zero, this net zero school we're getting in Occoquan, something that I could give them back to, sure. to, to explain, because I'm hearing bits and pieces of what's gonna happen in that school. I'm hearing that there's gonna be something with the uh, Cedar, uh, Mr. Mara Noble's plan, that's an instructional piece. But I just need you to have an update so I, so I can look intelligent. Happy to update you. Intelligent. Thank yes, you. Ma yes, ma'am. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say um, first to Mr. Uh, Richardson, thank you so much for all of your service um, leading as chair for the council, um, and um, thank you for all of your time you served on the school board. I think that you provided a valuable perspective um, to our council, and it's always exciting to me to see people boasting about learning new things. I think that's very encouraging for all of us, um, and uh, great leadership. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, for also from my perspective as uh, someone who's a Prince William County, former Prince William County student, who um, I know it's been decades since the dinosaurs roamed when Lake Ridge Middle opened, but I remember planting trees and being a founding member of the Ecology Club there. And it's nice to see that we have students still continuing to lead the way when it comes to sustainability and environmental issues. But even more so as a board member, I remember when this program was outsourced. And we have come a long way as a school division from having an outsource to being in-house. And the change and the leadership and the, the direction that we've gone in has been monumental and deserves to be applauded. Um, of course, I'm biased and, and um, overjoyed that my school, Freedom High School, um, received the Green School's Reverend de designation first. Um, thank you to Ms. Durian. I, I had the pleasure of uh, invading your space. Uh, freedom, um, freedom, sorry, I can't see. Um, there you are, yes. Um, freedom earlier this uh, week to do my board brief taping there. Thank you for letting me hold a bearded dragon and uh, talk all about sustainability issues. Um, I uh, love environmental science. I didn't have the opportunity to go to school for it, but I'm a self-proclaimed science nerd, so I always enjoy hearing about it. I would like to hear more uh, at a later date about how we are coming on our LED replacement lighting throughout of our schools, um, mostly because I know that impacts our students and our staff's day-to-day -day environment. Um, it, there's, it's interesting when you go down one hallway and it's lit up bright like it's sunny in um, June outside and then you go to another hallway and it's not quite as bright because the LEDs just make that much of a difference. Um, and I'd like to also hear about some updates of how we're doing in some of our older schools. Um, I know that I am um, fortunate, my district is very fortunate to have a new elementary um, for the first time in decades. I know we did the Kilby replacement, um, but we're having a new elementary. We're not as blessed land, as far as land, wise um, as Miss Jesse to be able to have a net zero school there due to the land foundation and, and some issues there. But um, I, I do agree with Miss Jesse. I think it would be nice if board members um, were equipped with some terminology um, so that we can express it and, and talk intelligently and, and have the ability to communicate with the general public. Because every time we're able to make a touch point, I think that further encourages our sustainability issues and any way that we can um, speak knowledgeably about it from a, a very basic perspective, I think helps us all. Um, and just to wrap up, I just want to thank everyone for your participation. I know how hard it is to serve on uh, joint councils and, and with the county and school division and just councils in general, it's very time consuming. And if you're passionate about it, um, it can raise your blood pressure sometimes. So I just wanna thank all members involved and I just wanna give kudos to Dr. McDade for continuing this program and um, for all of us leading the way. Um, it, it really is a joint effort, so thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Jackson. I just want to also echo my appreciation for the presentation tonight and the time and dedication of the energy management and sustainability team. I know that you also, all of you, advocate for sustainability issues outside of your work hours, and I just appreciate your passion and commitment to the future for all of our students. I know that some of you came to speak to JET, and thank you, Ms. Weimer for, and other PWCS staff um, for their time on JET, which I also serve on, and I support the initiatives that you listed, and thank you, Don, for your time on this. So, thank you.
Yeah, and I'm remiss to thank Adele Jackson for serving as our representative on the JET Task Force. So we, we really appreciate your work and commitment to this. It has been great. Ms. Wall. All right, I want to thank um, Mr. Richardson, Ms. Weimer, and Mr. Bach for the presentation, the update. It's always great to hear what's going on in the school division with energy management and sustainability. So thank you very much, and for everybody who serves on the committee. Um, I, uh, I know it's a topic, these are topics that a lot of people have a lot of interest in, and especially the younger generation. Um, there's a lot of good science, technology, and innovation um, in, these, in this work, and um, I think it will serve our students well to be um, literate in this area. And also, it sounds like it's saving us quite a lot of money, and I know that it will continue to do so as we go into, as we do the ge geothermal um, upgrade at Bel Air, and then also the solar panels, the composting, the LED lighting, the water, smart water irrigation. Yep. I mean, there are a lot of things I think that a lot of people can get behind, so I really appreciate it. Um, I had a couple of questions about the compost pilot, um, the green ribbon, and energy challenge. So the compost pilot, I know we have it at 12 schools. Can you tell me, are we, is that funded through a grant? I, sorry, I know the answer yeah. to that. Never mind. What I want to know is, um, are we? What's our plan to expand composting? Because we we have it at 12 schools, but we have what 97 schools, and it seems like composting would be a very easy thing to expand. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just give a high level comment, and then I'll turn it over to Jess to add some additional. Um, yes, uh, that position is, or that funding is through a grant, and uh, that grant is coming to an end. We will be supporting that uh, moving forward uh, through division funds. Uh, and uh, you know, we're, we've talked a lot about uh, a, you know a, a strategic initiative coming forward through the budget to expand. So I, I'll turn that over to Jess and have her comment a little bit more on that. I'd actually like to invite my colleague, Jeannie Jabera, to the, the podium. She has been spearheading the grant for us for the last couple of years, so she would be able to, to speak better to that. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you. Um, we do have a proud, um, actually, I apologize. It's six schools who are composting, and um, we have looked at, um, we've done a presentation, looked at it, and it looks like that we are going to be studying the feasibility and getting it done. So um, we will be continuing it and at some very proud schools who very much want to continue composting. So, and hope in the future to get it up to as many schools as we possibly can who want to do the program. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope so too. I think that's something that kids can really learn about. And honestly, I need to learn about, so. Um, green, the green ribbon, it, it looks like we were, we were hoping to identify two schools. We have one this year, right? Correct. So we're going to double it. And then maybe f we'll go to four. And then, so do we, how do we identify? Okay, okay now. <laughs> how do we identify additional schools? Is it like an application process? Or do we have schools in the queue that we're working with that we're going, going to, that they're close or we can help them? Or how, how are we going to do that? Thank you. Yes, and um, composting helps a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, as, you, as you heard in the presentation, we have 58 schools who are currently doing, for doing our energy challenge. So we have, as we've run this program for 10 years, we've identified schools who have a very a passion uh, their leadership has a passion for sustainability and um, uh, environmental education. And so we've watched those schools, and I have um, approached them to say, would you like to be going through this? So yes, I do have a queue of schools, but I can't tell you who they are um, of schools. Um, as you ask, though, um, uh, additionally, Every year in Virginia, Virginia can only put forward, the entire Commonwealth can only put forward five schools. So um, when, we, when we do this, so we are looking forward to two, but we, there, you know, there, are, there probably isn't another school district who um, does as good a job of it, um, we think, but um, in terms of sustainability, but we do have to let them um, shine as well. So we're going to continue that. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think people no, we, would be very happy with us if we, you know, took all spots. their we took all their spots at once. I've got five that I could probably go, but that's not a good idea. Can I ask? Okay, so follow up. Wow, only five. Yeah, Interesting. that's. 
and so maybe we need to lobby Virginia, whoever the, they are, to expand it beyond five, five for the entire state of Virginia? Um, every Nomination? Ev oh, it's a federal. Ev every okay. state um, can only Nominate have five. a certain number. So, gotcha. yeah, it's, so not, not, it's not just, it's, that's the way the federal regulation it, is that five schools from every state can be recognized. Excellent. I just have one brief comment. Um, I think that the information about the net, Occoquan Net School, Net Zero School, is a very interesting topic. And so, um, as you publicize that, I know Ms. Jesse wants the information. I think all of us would be curious and interested um, in that information. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Maybe we'll bring you back to do a presentation in one of the fall meetings. Um, I know Ms. Zargapur. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, uh, Mr. Richardson, thank you for your, your time on this committee. Um, I, I, I aspire to be like you. You just do so many things, and, and, and you would think this is your job, and it was great. So thank you for your, your service and your service and your service. Um, Mr. Wallingford, I actually have a question for you. Um, I remember, I know, I remember uh, attending a joint board meeting where we were talking about um, our AAA bond rating and the different things that come into play. This energy management and sustainability can actually help with that, correct? Yes, it actually can. Uh, th that's, a, that's a very subtle, a very good question. There's something called ESG, and I'm not going to get into great detail on that, but um, the E stands for environmental, and it's one of the things that the rating agencies are looking at as far as uh, uh, grading us, AAA, AA, whatever it is. Um, it's not something that's very well defined. It's still in the process of being defined. Um, but it is something that they're looking at. It is one of the criteria. Um, when we, for example, go to New York, it's one of the things that uh, they sit and ask us questions about. So um, our efforts here uh, are recognized um, uh, through those processes, through the, the rating process. It's a really good question. Thank you. I think it's important that um, we look at the intersectionality of uh, different things that this does. We're, we're engaging our students. We, um, we are looking at sustainability, not just for environmental, but even uh, in educational, but also um, a little economic as well. I, I just, I, I, like, I like knowing that it, it, it go, it's, a, it's a deep dug well in this way, so thanks. Mr. Wilk, wow. why not? I'll just yeah. say at the end, since everyone else spoke, uh, thank you all, Mr. Richardson. Thank you for your service. All of you back there, thank you for still being with us tonight. Um, it seems like it's going to be a late night, but I appreciate you all staying in. Um, and of course, Mr. Bach, thank you. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Dr. McDay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to first thank Mr. Richardson for your service um, on, the, on the council. Early in my tenure, when I first arrived to, I'm sure you remember this, when I first arrived to Prince William County, you were one of the first um, advisory chairs to meet with me about the work that was happening with sustainability. I, I, and from that point forward, you have been all in in the work that we've been doing, um, have supported the strategic plan development, and so much has been accomplished. Uh, under your tenure and leadership on the council. So I just deeply appreciate your service, your commitment, and your support of um, the vision that we collectively hold for this work and the support of the strategic plan. So thank you very much. Um, and to the team, Jessica, and the entire team, and I don't know if everyone, that whole group back there, can you guys stand up? Stand please? up, stand up. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> They are um, a small but mighty team, and um, they have everything that we have in that strategic plan, which is very lofty goals. Um, they have been deeply committed and realizing those goals. So um, we are definitely on our way to meeting our commitments in the 2025 Launching Thriving Stru uh, Futures Plan. So I want to thank each and every one of you. They have a really robust continuous improvement plan where they've laid out um, over the, the two-year period, exactly how they're going to accomplish those goals, and they have been on target. So thank you so much. We are all deeply committed. I'm deeply committed. You have my 100% support of all of the initiatives that are outlined in our plan, and I appreciate every single thing that you're doing to advance this work in our school system.
Thank you, Dr. McDade. And I'll, I'll, I'll do one last victory lap. This board voted on this initiative three years ago, and, and, and it has, I think, exceeded all expectations. And so we are thrilled. And Jessica, your work, Vern, your work, Don, we can't thank you enough. Um, you know, to the point that um, Member Zargarpur made, you know, so I, I serve on the Board of Visitors at UVA, and, and this is my seventh year, eighth year, and seven years ago, we voted on an energy sustainability net zero commitment to go carbon neutral by 2030. And, and we had done it after already being ahead of the prior plan. And so we made, we recommitted. Um, we are one of four public universities in the country with a AAA bond rating. And one of the reasons is our energy sustainability commitment. And so as Mr. Wallingford mentioned, the folks on Wall Street, the markets are looking at this stuff. Prince William County, just to remind everyone, is one of 56 localities with a triple A bond rating in the entire nation. And so this work that you all are doing is helping us save money in so many other ways. We get to borrow at a far lower rate than other counties. We get um, recognized in, in ways that, you know, um, uh, we can sell bonds easier. People buy our bonds. So on top of us getting better interest rates, we sell them really fast. And so it's really great and it helps us fund all of our construction and the work we have to do and do it in an affordable way that saves money for all the taxpayers in this county. So thank you very much and, and we applaud you once again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. So uh, moving on to the Office of Associate Superintendent for Student Services and Post-Secondary Success 1501, Code of Behavior. Dr. McDade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, also, in the commitment of positive climate and culture, the Code of Behavior articulates um, expected norms and practices to ensure every student is learning in an environment of inclusivity, connectedness, and encourages social and emotional wellness for all. And so I do have um, present this evening our Associate Superintendent for Student Services and Post-Secondary Success, Success, Denise Hebner, um, as well as Dara Duggar, Duggar is here, our Director, um, and they will be presenting the PWCS Code of Behavior. As you know, it is required annually for us to review the code of behavior and make updates, especially with any um, changes that may be coming forward from the state level to ensure that we're in full compliance. And so they will be presenting the code of behavior, including um, any changes that have made or updates that have been made uh, to date. So thank you, Ms. Hebner. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman, Chairman Latif, Vice Chair Wall, members of the school board, Dr. McDade. Very excited to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you the proposed changes for the code of behavior that will be implemented in the school year 23-24. I'm also grateful to have Director Duggar here with me who has been leading this work. I'd like to recognize those who have collaborated on the project, um, specifically our legal team, our special education department, um, our equity office, and our instructional leadership team. This has been a collaborative effort to make sure that all voices are heard and represented. Um, additionally, we have significant community engagement and Director Duggar will speak to that as well. So our code of behavior aligns our commitment uh, to a positive climate and culture and our commitment to a thriving future with actions. The goal of this document is to ensure a safe and positive learning environment that results in academic success for our students. Often people think of the code of behavior as a document where we outline rules and guidelines for imposing sanctions for our students who violate the rules. Well, while there are rules and outcomes for students that are, who are not in alignment with expectations, the document also contains some very important information for our students and our families. The content of the Code of Behavior includes roles and responsibilities for our school staff, parents, and students. It includes information on our students' rights as well. Additionally, it includes information to ensure our students' families understand due process and what supports are available. In Prince William County Schools, we understand that organizational coherence is important at all levels and that training at the school level for implementation for staff and teaching expectations to students is the key to success. As outlined in our strategic plan, the goal is to reduce exclusionary discipline through the use of targeted strategies and interventions that set our students up for success. I would like to discuss um, one specific change in our code of behavior, and that is the addition of the definition of restorative practices. Restorative practices are preventative in nature, but do not excuse adherence to the guidelines set forth or expected behaviors. It also does not replace consequences. Prince William County Schools recognizes that effective implementation of any code of conduct requires provisions and appropriate behaviors be taught, practiced across settings with feedback, reinforced, and taught again based on situations or data. Approaching school discipline from an instructional preventative basis 
and a standpoint contributes to a positive school environment and ensures equity, fairness, and continuous improvement as it emphasizes belonging to a community and rewarding positive behaviors rather than negative behaviors, which often yields future yields, um, with the negative behaviors often result in suspensions or dropouts. Restorative practices means applying instructional preventive-based perspective to student behavior, and it is fundamental in a multi-tiered system of support, or MTSS, which you hear it referred to. It recognizes that in order for students to change behavior and learn expected behaviors, there must be targeted efforts to address the root cause so that learning occurs from sanctions that are put in place to reinforce expectations. It's important to note that restorative practices is different from the restorative justice programs that are implemented in the court system. Currently, Princeton County Schools is not involved in any implementation of restorative justice program for criminal offenses committed by our students. Princeton County Schools continues to take a firm stance on the code of behavior and violations that cause a significant disruption to the learning environment or pose a significant concern or safety concern for staff and students. Egregious violations, in particular, and specifically bringing a weapon on school grounds will continue to result in the recommendation for further disciplinary action to include expulsion. And at this time, I would like to turn our presentation over to Ms. Duggar, who not only serves as our division lead in the implementation of a code of behavior, but also serves on the VDOE committee that provides guidance to schools in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Ms. Duggar. Good evening. The Code of Virginia requires the Board of Education to provide model policy guidelines for school divisions that set the expectation for student behavior and enhance school safety, provide preventative and age-appropriate responses and supports before resulting to in exclusionary practices, requires access to quality education and behavioral interventions for students who are removed from the classroom, encourages partnerships with students and families to improve learning conditions, and sets the requirements of a biennial review of inc to incorporate policy and legislative changes. Based on the guidelines set forth, by, set forth, Prince William County Schools adopted the guidelines presented in Virginia Department of Education's model guidance of positive and preventative Code of Student Conduct Policy and Alternatives to Suspension to create the 2324 Code of Behavior, which promotes a safe and supportive learning environment by setting the expectations for student behavior, clearly defining those behaviors that do not meet expectations and the strategies and interventions the division will use to reinforce and teach positive behaviors, and the process of administrative response when violations occur. Next slide. Next slide, please. The collaborators for the 2324 Code of Behavior consist of a committee composed of school administ based administrators, school counselors, teachers, central office staff, parents, and students. Updates and changes to the Code of Behavior include feedback from stakeholders and a review of the document through an equity lens. Additionally, Updates include changes to Virginia Department of Ed's model guidance and the 2023 Virginia General Assembly session. And recommendations from the committee were discussed and supported by the Executive Cabinet and Division Council. Next slide. Areas of focus for the 2324 Code of Behavior include a focus on instructional and prevention-based practices through the use of multi-tiered systems of support, an adaptive and responsive framework that helps schools identify and provide targeted support for students who are struggling academically and or behaviorally, and restorative practices, which is an evidence-based preventative approach rooted in forming a sense of community and teaching positive behavior with the purpose of deterring students from negative behaviors. The use of MTSS and RP is not in lieu of a sanction, but affords school staff the ability to address the root cause so that learning occurs from the sanction and reinforces the expected behavior. Cultural competency, updated language that is inclusive and culturally responsive, integrating VDOE standard six, culturally competent standards of self-reflection, pedagogy and practice, learning environments and community engagement, 
and Prince William Depart um, County's Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion's framework, which focuses on engaging families and understanding their role, rights, and responsibilities in the implementation of the Code of Behavior. Title IX, updated language to align um, and compliance with federal guidelines, norming responses to the Code of Behavior violations, adopting Prince William County Schools dress code, dress and grooming policies based on state guidelines, clarification of behavior definitions and alignments with Prince William County Schools policy and regulations and procedures. Next slide. Legislative updates for the 23-24 Code of Behavior include policy changes around the notification of bullying from House Bill 1592 and Senate Bill 1072, Principals or their designee are required to notify the parent of any student involved in alleged incident of bullying within 24 hours of learning of the allegation of bullying. Next slide. In accordance with the Code of, Behavior, Code of Virginia, Prince William County will offer the following training opportunities to school staff. Administrative decision making for weapons violations, administrative responses to vaping, possession, and distribution of prohibited substances, preventative and restorative responses to school discipline before and after a behavior infraction, and the integration of VDOE's education, educator cultural competency standards for school staff in collaboration with the Department of Tiered Supports and Interventions and the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Using behavior categories to appropriately capture code of behavior violations and norming the process for implementation of the code of behavior. I will now turn it over to Mrs. Hubner, who will close out the presentation for the 2324 code of behavior revisions. Thank you. So as you can see, there have been some extensive comp comprehensive changes. Our goal is to make this document a family-friendly document that allows parents access to information and support. And at this time, that concludes our presentation. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I love Code of Behavior. It's my favorite. I know. Um, <laughs> I just want to first say thank you very much to you, um, Ms. Hubner, and your team for all the work that goes on for the Code of Behavior. I know you're at the top of the pyramid for this, um, but I know, Daria, that you really lead the charge, and I appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that you wholeheartedly include students and all stakeholders in the Code of Behavior, and this year, um, I can't be more excited about the Code of Behavior chart of changes. Um, I love that with Dr. McDade's administration, we include things like indexes and glossaries because there are so much rhetoric out there about a term and what I think uh, we do very well here in Prince William County Schools is define what the term means so that you don't have any misunderstanding around um, commonly misunderstood things such as DEI, what is permissible for a student dress, um, what restorative practices means being a proactive approach, and that we still have discipline. I also appreciate that we spend so much time explaining what comes from the state that we are legally required to do when it comes to go to behavior and what the state practices are and how we fold them into our practices and are compliant. Um, oftentimes I think that is also another misstep um, in rhetoric that's out there surrounding the public as to where things come from and how they end up in our documents or our policies. Um, so I very much appreciate that. <clears throat> I noticed still, I'm always gonna harp on student dress. Are we going to be um, doing anything differently this year? Um, I know with COVID, a lot of students wore pajamas, and of course, fashion trends always change. Um, are we doing anything to implement with fidelity and to kind of remove bias on what it means to dress appropriately in our schools? So I'll let um, Director Duggar speak. We do have um, a series of planned ways that we're going to, as we have talked about, teach behaviors and, and expectations of students. So I'll let her touch on that briefly. Thank you, I appreciate it. Because no matter which, gener depending on which generation you are in, and there are four of them now in the workplace, appropriate dress can mean very different things. 
So the management of uh, dress and grooming is at the school-based level. So the guidelines that we presented today um, present um, what our overall division guidelines are, and then we will be working with school-based administrators um, to kind of work with them to set the policies within their school buildings and how to appropriately manage um, violations when they occur. Okay, thank you, because I, I, I um, have heard repeatedly over the years, especially from um, some of our minority parents and our, our parents or guardians who have students who develop faster, you know, you could come to school two same students can come to school wearing identical outfits and they appear completely different on their bodies. So I would like to, for us to be able to do our due diligence, um, and if we're going to do one for one one individual, we do the same for the other, um, because I know it has a dramatic impact on our student self-esteem, and um, enforcement definitely varies, so I'm very proud of the fact that we are going to be implementing those things with fidelity, and I'm sure a lot of our young female students will also be very appreciative of this as well. Yes. Um, so that's all I have for right now. I know this is on for information, and we'll vote next week, so thank you very much. Jesse. Hi. Culturally responsive, restorative practice, culturally competent, and the question I have is, and it's the same question I asked you when we were talking earlier, I am very concerned with how this thing is going to roll out and how teachers are going to perceive it and whether or not we're going to have any fidelity or consistency or norms for how to run these groups, who's going to do the training. I think the last, at our meeting, we talked about principals doing the training. That really does concern me. Uh, but who's going to train the principals and who's going to be the person to oversight this? And the second question is, Will teachers look at this and say, well, can I, can I still send them to the office? Because uh, at the end of the day, I can, I can just, I guess because I've been out there and I've seen people run groups and those groups run well, but if there are no parameters and you have this little group meeting and everyone's talking and nothing happens at the end and the kids are still misbehaving, I just, I'm just concerned about these terms and, you know, we have questions about standard-based learning and whether or not we're consistent with that. And we also have teachers saying there's too much in-service. So how do you guys balance all that? I know I'm asking several questions, but it's probably the same question. What's going to happen? What is it going to look like? So the implementation of um, MTSS and RP is through, is a collaborative effort. So we'll be working with the Department of Tiered in, um, Instruction, as well as our DEI department, who will roll out the implementation and planning and support, not only for school-based administrators, but also school staff. So it's, a, it's an ongoing effort. Um, I do have my partners here with me this evening. Um, but again, it's a collaborative effort, and the goal is to um, certainly work at my level and in, within my department to focus on the sanctions and norming the practices, but the support for teachers and implementation will come from the other departments. You know, when we talk about professional learning communities and teachers getting into the groups to discuss what they're going to do during the planning sessions, there has to be norms, and I know that there has to be norms because at the end of the day, you run into a discussion about what, what, what did you go, where did you go last night? Or, you know, without norms, nothing happens in these groups. And I'm, I'm still very concerned about, I know you keep guys keep saying, using this term collaborative, collaborative. What does that really look like? I'm just concerned that teachers are going to say another thing to do is too vague for me. And again, can I still send them to the office? So, Ms. Jesse, the the it, I hear your concerns, and you know, it is our goal to make sure that they're, you know, everyone's educated, and that we have a systemic way that we implement our code of behavior. We are going to provide not just a one and done training, but ongoing training. We do have um, access to our school administrators through our level associates are supporting this effort. It's not one person; it's multiple. It's all of us. So the collaboration means that it's not just 
Ms. Duggar writing the code of behavior and saying implement it, it means that we all own an important piece of this and that the focus really is creating that safe and positive environment. I hear you that teachers need support. We need the, the classroom to be focused. And so the norms and the expectations that you're talking about are really the framework. That's what the code of behavior does. We understand that at the school level, teachers need to be able to approach that with their administrators. Each school may have different needs, significant needs, and those will be addressed in staff meetings. But there is a common set of expectations of what we want to see for implementation. So this is a normed expectation that can be implemented at the school level. Ms. I just saw Ms. Jessie's face there, the, just the, the look on her face at the end. Um, uh, the division I work for actually calls this students' rights and responsibilities. As a teacher in the classroom, and I've been doing a lot of this in the past few weeks, more than ever before because it is the end of the school year, um, I remind students that they're there to learn and that when you get in someone's way, you are interfering with their right to have a free and appropriate education. As a teacher, I have dealt with very difficult classes before in my career. I've dealt with classes that were just perfect and awesome, and you want to record and repeat those, right? Um, so I think some of the things that <clears throat> some people may be thinking about, and this is to tag a little bit onto Miss Jessie, is that um, sometimes teachers don't feel supported in their classrooms. Um, sometimes there are um, bumps in implementation. We, we all have experienced things like that. But I also think that it's important that you know, we talk about parents making sure that they're involved in this as well, too. So, um, you know, I don't want to be the teacher who, you know, sends home the emails and does the phone calls and I don't hear anything back. I want to work with the parents and make sure that we're working together to support our students so that everyone can learn inside the classroom. Is, uh, could you speak just a little bit to um, how important that partnership is. Um, it's, it's not just, you know, we drop the kids off in the classroom and we, you know, hope no one gets a referral and everything goes okay. It, it's, we all work in this together, and you did say collaborative, but could you speak a little bit more about, um, you know, supporting our students, supporting our teachers, supporting our parents through these ki kinds of things? So again, there's, a, there's various different parts to the code of behavior. And you know, legislation says that yes, we have to be preventative, we have to teach, but a large part is making sure that learning is happening within that environment. And so our goal and our approach is to give staff and administrators the tools that they need to be able to appropriately address um, those behaviors, but at the same time, letting them know and helping them to understand what that litmus is when that behavior needs to be escalated to the next level and that it's okay to you know sometimes reach outside of the building for those supports that you might need to be able to address those behaviors as long along with the parents um, in our collaboration with the Department of DEI and uh, tiers instruction we're doing a series to support them and understanding their rights and roles and responsibilities in supporting schools and um, their ability to know what's happening with their student to be notified when those things are happening and then how we will be addressing those things as those behaviors escalate. So it doesn't, you know, leave students in the classroom to behave inappropriately for various long times without any support, but letting folk know that there are other mechanisms by which there's those supports come and but we're expecting to teach and support you once those things, and hopeful that those things will go well before we have to go to those measures. So hopefully that gives a little bit more clearance to how the three departments are working together and supporting students, supporting parents, and supporting the school staff in managing those behaviors. Thank you, and um, just, I know bullying comes up a lot, uh, and, and there was something in the presentation that talked about um, a change that things must be reported within 24 hours. Is that both for um, potential perpetrator and potential victim? Is it like anyone involved in an allegation of, of bullying? And then do we have a process for what that's going to look like? Um, or um, how do I put this? Um, you know, if, you, if, if I'm a parent and I receive information that my child was bullied, or if I'm a parent and I, I receive information that my child may have bullied someone, do we know yet what we can expect in that process? 
So the notification definitely has to happen because that's state law. Um, what that process looks like, there's currently a process in place now, but that will also include what that notification looks like, norming that across all schools and at all levels so that everyone's aware of when these things are reported, it's you know, documented appropriately, and then those things are, notifications are sent out to families um, as, as stated. And can we also recognize that we, we know that sometimes something happens where an adult doesn't catch it in that moment. A child might say something much later. Um, it, <clears throat> what, what, what might that look like? So I, I want to just um, make a note that in your document that you have the draft of the Code of Behavior, on page 15, it talks about the right for free, um, to be free from bullying, discrimination, and harassment. It also refers to our regulation and the process for reporting. So on the back part, page 45 to 47, is a very descriptive um, process if parents have a concern. I also want to be clear that it does not take a written notification. School administration is expected to follow up on any allegation of bullying. Parents will be notified of anyone who's involved in that allegation within 24 hours. There will be communication in writing. We have specific process that will be rolled out um, to our administrators as part of the professional development and training this summer that there are specific steps. There will be guide and parents will be able to look at that revised regulation once it's posted in August. But for now, you could look at the end, page 45. Last thing, I promise. Thank you for that. I also know that we're trying to make sure that there's links to things for parents and, and um, everyone to get to much more easily. So thank you so much for doing that because it, it is frustrating trying to like Google for information sometimes. Thanks. Ms. Jackson. All right, thank you for the presentation tonight and um, for all the accompanying documents. Um, I just want to just before I ask my question, just kind of say that the, as you probably are aware that the number one thing, well, top three things I hear from staff are behavior concerns. And I, I appreciate the, that there are going to be places where people can discuss it in staff meetings. But um, I know from personal experience, sometimes it's difficult to have those discussions. So I hope that, and I know you probably are, at creating safe spaces for those discussions to be had um, and alternate spaces outside of staff meetings. Um, so my actually have the same questions about uh, that um, Ms. Zagabor had about bullying, because I think I, I look at this and I'm wondering how uh, we're going to do this in 24 hours, um, and like what processes are we going to follow to ensure compliance. And I was just, I'm not advocating for more training. I'm not. But um, I know that everybody has a different, and I know that the definition for bullying is in here on page 47 and 45 through 47. But I know that everybody has a different definition for bullying. Will there be a way to make sure that both staff, parents, guardians, and students are informed um, of the bullying outside of reading this um, to make sure that everybody has a common definition? And then I, again, have the same concerns that Ms. Sagabor mentioned. Um, so our intention is to provide this. Every parent receives the opportunity to review the Code of Behavior as part of the um, start of the year, the back to school packet. Um, additionally, we're working with our family and community engagement um, staff in the equity office to make all of our information more parent friendly and available. It is, it will be included in our regulation. As I said, you can find it currently the definition on page 20 as part of the Code of Behavior. Um, I think that one of the confusions we often have is there are bullying behaviors, but bullying is a different definition. Bullying is repeated over time with an imbalance of power, and I think sometimes that is difficult to separate the two. None of it is acceptable. You know, I want to be clear that I hear you. I know the difficulty. I've been a teacher in the classroom. It's been a while. It's been, you know, a bit, but I can remember the frustration with, you know, maintaining order, student behaviors, we understand that teachers need support and we understand that our administrators need to be there to create a lot of different avenues for both parents and staff to understand what is included in the code of behavior and how we can end behavior that is not appropriate and promote positive behavior. So I don't have a one and done answer. I can't say this is the thing that's going to happen, but I will tell you that we'll be approaching this from multiple avenues. Um, you know, information on our website, information in the Code of Behavior, information when parents attend back to school at night. There's a lot of opportunities for parents to seek that out, but we're also going to be pushing that out in, you know, in part of our notifications and our publications so that it, it gets to the parents. Parents don't have to seek it out on their own. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, 
I've been waiting. Um, and I've kind of already warned you, I'll be voting against this again. Um, I think we have a, like Wade said, you're a hardliner on behavior to me a second ago. And I am. And I don't know, fundamentally, clearly, that doesn't go with probably the notion of all the competing forces of what we're doing here. Um, and, and really, it comes down to, I, I just don't think the consequences are severe enough. I think until, I'll say it again, until we start inconveniencing parents for those repeat offenders, for the ones who just continually disrupt class and cause that learning environment to go haywire, whatever you want to say, until they're inconvenienced, I think this is going to continue to persist. And, you know, I, I, I like the, the, I believe we're doing a lot of good things, but again, I think there's a lot of gray area uh, in here. And I think when we sometimes leave things open to interpretation, a common feeling that I hear from parents, whether again it's real or not a feeling, is that sometimes they believe their principal's hands are tied, that they would do more and suspend more or enforce harsher punishment if they felt like their principal could. And I'm not telling you that's, again, I don't have the facts behind that. I'm just telling you something that can been resonating with me throughout the year. And unless we have, in some sense, defined kind of instead of gray but black and white, I, I don't think we're ever going to get past this. And and so ultimately, in the end, I know there's not like some quick change or something in two weeks you're going to make that's going to, you know, have me switch my beliefs and ideas on this. Um, and I again, I appreciate your guys' time. I know this is not an easy thing, um, but that's where I said, that's my philosophy on this, a zero tolerance approach. And again, I know that may not be kind of the direction the state's going and such, but that's where I stand. And, and that's probably why I'm gonna continue voting against the code of behaviors until we move more towards that hard line approach. Uh, who's next, Williams? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask if we can consider um, maybe utilizing some of our technology to remind parents and guardians and um, other uh, members of Prince William County School families, because everyone doesn't have parents, um, that um, to, to check the code of behavior maybe a couple times a year. A lot of the comments that I hear um, could directly be answered if we referred back to the code of behavior. Um, and I, th I think that would be also very helpful because it's one of those documents you read at the beginning of the year, sort of check mark off, and then, like when your student gets in trouble or there's a disciplinary issue or there's a whatever issue, the answers are often found in the code of behavior. And I know we can't make parents read it or guardians or even students um, pass that initial time if they make it through all 47 pages. But I do feel like it, a lot of the resources um, that answer the questions are there. I mean, just in the the document that accompanies it with the chart of changes talks about, Mr. Wilk, you may want to check this out, the, um, that, that research for showed frequent out-of-school suspensions, zero tolerance policies, and get tough approaches to school safety are ineffective and increase the risk for negative social and academic outcomes, especially from children from historically disadvantaged groups. So um, I know there's a lot of good information in here, and I just think it would be helpful if we could use some of our technology just to remind our school family members and community that the information is there for them to utilize. Thank you. Ms. Wall. All right, thank you. Um, I want to echo some of the comments that have been made about behavior um, in our schools. It's definitely one of the topics that I hear the most. Um, I think it's been hard. I think that we have a lot of challenging behaviors. I don't know all of the root causes, if it's technology or cell phones, or YouTube or TikTok or, or COVID or parenting, lack of follow through on parenting, I have no idea. Um, I think there are a lot of causes. Um, but I will say um, it is something we really do need to, we need to keep working at because it is a big concern of families and teachers. I hear it from families and teachers and kids. Kids who don't feel safe in school because of the things that they see and they see that kids are getting away with things that, um, that they shouldn't be getting away with. 
And I know there's probably a critical mass in a classroom if you're a teacher and you have one or two kids who are acting out, you can kind of keep that under control, but if you have seven or eight, now, now you, you have a bigger problem. Um, so I think it's worth that we, you know, we keep chipping away at it. I'm ho I, I will be looking through this entire document. Um, I just want to say, I, s some of our answers might be even more um, revolutionary. Um, for instance, a school I visited in Washington, D.C., when we walked into the school, there were cell phone lockers in the entryway, in the vestibule, and all of the students there had to put a, their cell phone in the locker, and they couldn't have it with them the entire day. Now, I know in Prince William County that probably wouldn't go over well, but I will say from the conversation I had with people at that school, staff at that school, it made a huge difference because a lot of things that are going on, distraction, cyberbullying, you name it, is happening with distractions of cell phones. And um, so revolutionary idea, I know, probably you would never go anywhere, but worth talking about, I think. Um, and another thing might be even something like uniforms, and I know that wouldn't go over very well either. But again, you know, you remove a lot of the distractions and problems that can be caused. Um, but I guess I'll wrap up by saying, you know, setting the expectations for student behavior, I think this is a, this is a problem or a topic that we will, re will require everybody getting on board, not just the code of behavior, but the teachers, the administrators, the parents, the students. I think there's no way we're going to make a change if we don't um, have commitment from all of those, all of those stakeholders. And, and it is a topic that everybody is concerned about at a very, um, at a very practical level. So um, I know, I mean, I agree with Mr. Wilk that you know, s sometimes we have to just get really tough. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know all the research. Um, but I do appreciate the work that's gone into the revisions of the Code of Behavior and complying with state guidelines and, and other things like that. I just hope that it's, in, that it's going to move things in the right direction because I feel like right now it's been a really rough year. So anyway, th those are my comments. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilk. All I want to say, um, I think, thank you, Ms. Wall. Um, I think, you know, linking studies and such is great. I would just encourage other parents to ask other parents or even teachers how they feel about discipline and behavior right now. And I think that'll answer a lot of my concerns. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seamer. All right. Um, at this time, it is time for superintendent's time. No, 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 no. 1602. Appointment. Is that right? 1602. Appointment and announcement of student representatives for the 2023-24 school year. And we will now move on to this. And a motion is in order. Vice yes, Chair Wall. Oh, okay. All right, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board appoint Isabella Aversano and Fernanda Morante Escobedo as student representatives to the Prince William County School Board and appoint Jacqueline Garcia as the alternate student representative to the Prince William County School Board for the 2023-24 school year. Ms. Williams. I'd like to second. Ms. Williams seconds the motion. Discussion. I would just like to point out that the school board does not itself make these selections. I think it's important for everyone to know that there's a process and students are asked to apply in this process. Each high school will make, um, will interview candidates and, and I think nominate towards the central office. And then our central office um, has a committee that goes through the nominations from each of the high schools. And I think we had a record number of students apply. I think over 120 or plus students apply countywide. And so um, uh, it's, a, it's a great process that the school board actually itself does not weigh in on. This is done by um, high schools and um, central office staff. So thank you. Uh, please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Ralston, motion passed. All right, moving on to superintendent's time, Dr. McDade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
The authentic engagement of students is vital to the success of PWCS and student school board representatives and the student senate serve a crucial role in amplifying the voices and perspectives of our student makeup. And I'm really um, pleased with all of the work that has happened with our, our students, both in the Senate as well as the school board and in schools, because we do have a commitment to having a student voice, voice committee in every single middle and high school. And, and we also have student leadership um, committees in elementary school currently. So I'm really excited about what I'm seeing. I got a chance to visit T. Clay Wood today. Um, they are a leader in me school. And the students led a leadership day, facilitated a full leadership uh, morning, and it was just phenomenal. So um, there's a lot of great work happening with our student leaders. And the student board representatives, um, this is a really important role because of their engagement uh, with the board and representing their respective student bodies. So I would like to thank the 2022-23 student representatives, Donia Sharifi from Gainesville High School, Chance Williams from Forest Park High School, and Christian Daniels from C.D. Hilton High School in representing themselves, our students, and PWCS, they have really worked with honor, tenacity, and care. And I am grateful for their contributions and thankful for their service to Prince William County Schools and wish them well in their future endeavors as they depart from Prince William County and pursue post-secondary success. For the 23-24 school year, I'm really proud to welcome our new student school board representatives, Isabella Aversano from Gainesville High School, Fernanda Morante from Forest Park High School, and alternate Jacqueline Garcia from Osborne Park High School. And I had an opportunity to see Fernanda in action, um, and she is uh, just a really dynamic student leader, so I'm excited about the leadership that these three will bring to the board. We are excited to welcome our new student voices and eagerly looking forward to working with them to fulfill our mission to see every student graduate with the knowledge, skills, and habits of mind necessary to create a thriving future for themselves and their community. Grounded in commitment to positive climate and culture, PWCS is dedicated to the inclusivity and celebration of our students, families, and staff. The diversity of our community is our superpower and is how we see solutions and create resolutions, which is why, along with the school board, I'm proud to recognize June 2023 is LGBTQ plus Pride Month. We have staff and students who recognize that month, and in the spirit of inclusivity, we are recognizing that month. We recognize our students and staff because we care. We are committed to inclusive, supportive, and encouraging school environments for the safety, security, and belonging of everyone, and we want all students and staff to feel like they belong in Prince William County. And we ask our community to join us in celebrating all staff, students and staff, inclusive of gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. PWCS is committed to a respectful, safe, and welcoming environment for all of our students and staff. Um, an encouraging example of our division's work of inclusivity may be found in our robotics program. Currently, we have 79 schools participating in the robotics program, 13 high schools, 16 middle schools, and 50 elementary schools. Over three years, PWCS Robotics has seen a 106% increase in student participation, and within the same three years, 116% increase in female participation. Proudly, 38% of our 1,905 students are female, and the inclusive engagement with robotics is thriving. We are so proud of our expansive robotics program, and next board meeting, we will be recognizing our robotics teams. But tonight, I want to present a short video highlighting just the tip of the robotics iceberg. You guys put it up, it's not showing on the screens. The music's great. Oh. Can we start it over, please? Sorry. Thank you. Oh, very good.
underhook are all things we brought from last year's ROV. So back to our current iteration. You can see the similarities to the last version, but with plenty of new things. Here's a quick design explanation for our ROV. The motor movement starts here with the slow motor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes the superintendent's time. Thank you, Dr. McDade. Okay, moving on to committee updates. We have Ms. Wall, School Health Advisory Board. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, we had a meeting of the School Health Advisory Board on May 26th. Um, Ms. Jackson and I were there. Um, the health the health School Health Advisory Board advises the school division on a broad topic in sp of, or on specific aspects of the health program. And our meeting on the 26th, um, we received a very good and comprehensive mental health awareness update, which I thought was fantastic. Um, and, and I would actually recommend that we perhaps bring that presentation to the board. It was, it was very informative and very um, helpful, helpful for understanding um, mental, health, mental health situation in our schools and in our communities. Um, we also got an update on immunization noncompliance. So this always catches families <laughs> unawares because there are certain immunizations that are required before um, students um, can enter school. And um, sometimes families procrastinate it thinking that they'll just get an appointment, you know, the week before school, but then everybody has the same idea and then there aren't enough appointments. But it's really important that families be aware of what immunizations are required for school and get those done early. And I know the nurses are working really hard to get that information out to families. And I would just encourage any families listening that you pay attention to those notifications and that you get those immunizations done early. Because if you wait, you may run into the situation where your child is not allowed to come to school. And I believe they're going to be pretty strict about that this year. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, also, Teresa Polk is retiring, so that was her last meeting with the School Health Advisory Board, and I just want to say thank you for her many years of dedication and service to Prince William County Schools and to growing our nursing staff and nursing program and all of the great work that she has done. Um, and we had a great time visiting with her, and um, it was a good meeting, and I think that, um, like I said, it would be great to hear more about the mental health awareness data that was shared um, at, in this meeting. I think it's something that could possibly benefit a lot more people. So I don't know if there's anything else that Ms. Jackson wants to add, but um, it's a good committee and um, I'm thankful to the people who serve on it. Ms. Jackson. Um, I just want to echo, I think that was a great summary. Um, I also agree that the presentation on mental health was exceptional and it would be at some point be great to have more people see it. And I also want to thank Ms. Teresa Polk for her service. So thank you, Ms. Wall, for this summary. Outstanding, thank you. Okay, up next is 1901 Revision of Policy 737, Search and Seizure First Reading. Um, we will have a number of these up for first reading. So um, I don't know, do we have anybody up for, the, what's that? Yep, I believe oh, this yep, is. Mr. Mr. Anderson, Division yep, Council. I believe this is me. So uh, the revisions to Policy 737 are fairly minor, but they're, uh, uh, they're designed to incorporate the school board's decision to implement weapons detection systems. So it asks that the superintendent create regulations for the usage of those systems as administrative searches um, and that you know certain things be done like posting notices on the buildings that those are in use things like that, just the details necessary to implement that. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty minor change to the actual policy. The regulation will spell out how those weapons detection systems uh, will be operated. Okay, so if you have any questions, please contact Division Council over the next couple of weeks, and the public certainly can take a look at it and um, send any questions or concerns, and we will vote on this in two weeks. Uh, 1902. Um, so I'll take, if, okay. uh, if, you, if it's okay, Mr. Chairman, I'll take 1902 and 1903 Yeah, together. yeah, go for it, brother. Um, so these are essentially technical changes that are required by the changes to, you'll recall that um, recently we adopted uh, to go into effect July 1, uh, a pretty substantial revision to our social media policies. Um, and that was after a year or two long effort to uh, spearheaded by former council, uh, Division Council Mary McGowan and her staff to go through and um, really make our social media policies more robust. And these are technical changes for conformity's sake. 
Okay, again, with these policies, please contact Division Council over the next couple of weeks if you have any concerns, and again, with the public, same. Um, okay, at that point, that brings us to board matters. Tonight, we'll start with Mr. Wilk, and then to remind the board members, we will, oh, he's gone, he left. Oh, he's on break, that's fine, we'll start with Ms. Arkmer. Just to remind board members, we will be re-entering closed session to finish what we could not complete earlier on the agenda for closed session items. So, a reminder, okay. Uh, Ms. Argapur. All right, thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, so parents or families and, and, and educators play a crucial role in shaping students' behavior and their collaboration is essential for holistic development of a child, of the child. When parents and teachers work together, they can create a strong support system that benefits the students in numerous ways. Um, parents have that in-depth understanding of their own children, their personality, their likes or dislikes, weaknesses, strengths, and all that. And uh, the teachers have the expertise in the educational and classroom management. So together, we need to be working um, to make sure that our students are successful in schools. Just a reminder. Um, it is graduation week for many, many students. Uh, I know when the parents uh, first put their kids in school, they hope that their children like their teacher, make friends, and learn something. And as they learn and grow through the, through the years, it gets to 12th grade and all of a sudden they're graduating. There's something that I do uh, with my students. Um, I, I only see up to sixth grade in my school. But uh, I get kind of choked up thinking about where are you headed at this time of year. So I'm going to share the lyrics to a song that I think is, um, I don't know, just it's one of those things. May you ha it's, a Jason, it's a Jason Mraz song. Um, I want you to uh, have it all is the name of it. Um, so here's just a few of the lyrics. So to the class of 2023, may you have auspiciousness and causes of success. May you have the confidence to always do your best. May it take no effort in your being generous, sharing what you can, nothing more, nothing less. May you know the meaning of the word happiness, and may you always lead from the beating in your chest. May you be treated like an esteemed guest, and may you get to rest, and may you catch your breath. May the best of your todays be the worst of your tomorrows, and may the road less paved be the road that you follow. So here's to the hearts that you're going to break. Here's to the lives that you're going to change. Here's to the infinite possible ways to love you. I want you to have it all. Good luck in your endeavors, class of 2023. Whatever it is you are doing, whether it's a gap year or you're working or you are off to college or you have a job lined up or you're serving in the military, I wish you luck and success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Report. Mr. Wilk. Um, thank you. Um, just a couple highlights of things that have occurred um, that, um, you know, it's a special time of year. So like Ms. Zagapur was talking about, obviously the graduation ceremonies are uh, really special last Sunday night, uh, Forest Park, uh, this Sunday night, past whatever, Sunday night, Forest Park um, had their graduation ceremony. Um, and it was, it was very nice. It had a kind of a unique kind of theme because the principal's son was graduating and his speech uh, about adjusting uh, to changes in life uh, and pivoting was his word. Um, it was just, it was a really compelling emotional night and I just thought it was great for that special touch. Um, it's great to see also um, all the teachers who have their kids graduating and, you know, um, like Miss Wall. Um, yeah, I saw you that photo too. Um, but yeah, so I, I just think it's a really um, exciting time. Um, and as like Lisa said, no matter kind of what pathway or what you're gonna do next, um, and you know, I just think it's a really exciting time. Anyways, a um, couple of things, Montclair Elementary School, um, a couple of events I went to, I'm not gonna go through them all again. Uh, I give them credit, they did their first spring fling as their PTCO. Um, I always appreciate when schools try to start an annual tradition, uh, so they did that, and I thought it was very successful. Patty had their big, uh, very exciting PTO bingo night. Uh, it kind of launched my birthday weekend. Um, <laughs> it was fun, it was exciting, a lot of families there. Um, so uh, it was nice to be there. Uh, Swans Creek, I got to be there, um, not just as a, a school board member, but as a parent uh, and see my son interact at the school day. It was really cool and nice. Um, I, when it comes to some of the academic stuff, um, Potomac High School invited me uh, to be in their AP government class um, as their AP senior students were presenting. Uh, their final 
kind of capstone projects. Uh, it was very informative, uh, a couple good presentations that I was able to witness, one about um, halal food, the Cambridge program, handicapped parking spaces. I just thought the students did a great job with the research and what they did. Uh, trying to just pick some different schools here. Da, 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 da. Ashland, I was there back to back. They had an artist come in from Washington, D.C., uh, Mr. Melvin, uh, Dr. Melvin Nesbitt, Jr. Uh, he presented uh, and did a kind of uh, a whole little seminar, I guess, for the students and the families there. They had a strings concert the next night, which was great. The teacher retirement ceremony, where Ms. Williams, Ms. all of us, were we mostly all of them. Not you, this. No, I'm just kidding. But most of us were there. Uh, but it was a good event, and uh, yeah, I know um, it was the greatest ceremony. And then lastly, um, I was able. Uh, Miss Wall ventured all the way over here to Forest Park. Uh, there was a nice uh, regional championship match um, with uh, Battlefield, and um, although we lost, it was really cool. You got to present that trophy. I thought that was a really special moment. Cool. Anyways, thank you all. Miss Jackson. Okay, um, thank you to all those who came and spoke tonight. The last few weeks have been extremely busy with many events celebrating all students. Congratulations to those who are graduating from high school, middle, and elementary school. It's an exciting time and I wish you all the best on your next step. I just wanna take a moment to thank Christine Wade for her pending service to the Special Education Advisory Committee. Christine taught for eight years as a special education teacher in a self-contained classroom in a local district. She has a background in ABA therapy and worked as a private ABA therapist. She has kids in Prince William County Elementary School. She works as a substitute, or she worked as a substitute part-time, and now as a teacher assistant in our county in a preschool setting with a variety of needs in the classroom and offers one-on-one -on -one assistance when needed. She is well-versed in special education and I am extremely thankful for her service. I also want to say that I'm very grateful for the partnership of many businesses within our county. They provide vital assistance and support to students and staff. Policies are in place and updated to ensure that integrity is maintained. It is important for all stakeholders to act with integrity when, acting, when interacting or representing the school division. While the school division did not, have, uh, did not know about the flyers distributed, I'm calling on the school division to monitor all, closely all future um, collaboration with the data center industry. I have significant concerns regarding the proposed rezoning in Brunsville District, and I encourage all constituents to review the impact forms posted in today's board docs. Congratulations to the finance team on being awarded, I think I saw something about the Association of School Business Officials for Certific Certificate and Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, congratulations. And congratulations to all three Brunsville principals for the Khan Fellowship Awards. It was an extensive process, and I wish them all the best in the next step and that the knowledge um, that they will bring back to the division will be invaluable. Love and respect to everyone, and um, drive safely and good night. Ms. William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we know, June is LBGTQ plus and questioning Pride Month, PTSD Awareness Month, Gun Violence Awareness Month, Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month, and Immigration Heritage Month, as well as a host of celebrations that occur on specific days. I would just like to take this opportunity to remind the public and to thank my fellow board members um, because we kicked off our term in 2019 by updating our policies to prevent guns on school, camp, school grounds. Um, and we also did um, the first ever pride resolution for Prince William County Schools and I will always be proud advocates for both of those things. Um, I just want to issue a congratulations again to our student representatives. I don't think um, that myself or Ms. Jeffsey could have even envisioned how successful this program has has been for our school division when we came back from NSBA several years ago and begged our former board members to implement this. We were met with a lot of um, a, a lot of resistance, and I can say that we have far exceeded, um, I think, our expectations, and I'm proud that we have student representatives on our board, and now student rep and a student senate has grown out of that. Um, 
So congratulations to our three representatives who are leaving and the three new ones who are coming on board. Um, there are some events that I went to, a special shout out to Potomac U Tailgate. I promise from here in 2024, I will get in that dunk take with the principal and the students may throw as many balls as they would like. Um, it was fun times there at the tailgate. Also wanna thank uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated for their community health expo at Freedom High School. They did a wonderful job of kicking off the immunization season. Um, I also attended, like with one of my colleagues, the Prince William County Retirement Ceremony. Uh, my heart uh, is especially excited and a little bittersweet for some of those who are retiring this year, and I hope they will come back and romp with us. Um, my One of my favorite events th during the year is the CTE Signing Day. I just wanna say thank you to all the trades and everyone who participated in that. Uh, Mr. Wright is also retiring, and I um, wish him all the best and hope he continues to come back. Thank you to my distinguished frat brothers of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated who held a town hall this weekend on education and nonpartisan town hall. I want to thank Power Max uh, Company for holding a Stop the Violence uh, community event that I was able to participate and many of the graduations that I attended over the weekend and will look forward to attending soon, especially Independence in Hilton. Um, I just want to give a special shout out to um, a few graduates from Hilton, my goddaughter, and then to say I am so excited uh, to celebrate Juneteenth. Uh, it is a holiday that I look forward to and I'm thankful that it is a state and federal holiday and it's also my youngest birthday who's not happy about that, so big shout out to him. And with my last few seconds, since it is closing in at the end of the school year, I just want to say very quickly, a big shout out to all the kids who didn't win an award or make honor roll or barely made it through the school year. Big hug to the moms, dads, grandparents, caregivers, foster parents who stuck by them as they maneuvered through the school year. You are worthy of a pat on the back and a Facebook post. Don't forget those kids. Kindness, creativity, and tenacity often don't get the recognition that they deserve. So thank you. Miss Jessie. It is the 50th anniversary for Rockledge Elementary School. And so this is a shirt, t-shirt. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> would you please put the first two slides up, I think. You know I'm an alumni. Oh yeah. Well, now this slide, I love this slide. It's a photo of the graduation ceremony in Chance. And uh, Doctor, we were, uh, we were getting into good trouble because I said to Dr. McDay, later we did a group thing. I said to Dr. McDay, would you like to be in the picture? She said, no, because you guys are violating protocol. So I want to say I'm sorry that we were organizationally incoherent <laughs> during that time. And then we'll start. That is next. true, Miss Jessie. That's true. <laughs> you guys are taking up my time. I'm sorry. Tradition. Did you, oh, this is the anniversary slide for Rockledge. And then the next slide, I think, is of the donut tour. These are the donut tours. We've gone on five, uh, we've given out 70 about a thousand donuts, five dozen to the elementary, a 10 dozen to the middle, and this morning we gave 15 dozen to uh, the high school. And finally, I want to, the last, I think the last slide that we have is the Tada slide. You know, I wrote an article uh, for the, the uh, my newsletter, and years ago, 40 years ago, I guess, this lady, from Connecticut said to me, everybody has to have a tada. And I think that every student, everyone, the donuts, all these things are tada moments. So this is a tada to Doug Wright. He's the founder of our career program, the welding program, the plumbing program, Dominion uh, Electric. He helped me start that main aviation maintenance program. And I want to report that Piedmont Airlines has given us a $30,000 scholarship to one of the students at Woodbridge High School. And so to Doug Wright, he didn't ask me, he didn't ask for my permission to resign or to retire, neither did Jarslin and all these other people, but I just want to say that I appreciate everything that you've done, and I'm done. Thank you, Ms. Jesse. Ms. Wall. All right, um, wow. It's, we're here, we're at the end of the school year. I can't believe it, it's, it's awesome, it's amazing. This has been a great year. I was so excited for the start of the year back in September because 
we were able to begin a normal year and the excitement and energy at all of the back to school nights and the first days of school was just palpable. And I feel that way about graduation and everything that's happening at the end of the school year now. It's just so exciting and so amazing. I've attended some graduations. Last night was Battlefield and my own son graduated, so that was especially sweet. Um, I also have attended Unity Read and Brentsville District High School um, graduations and Pace West graduation, which is a very special and unique experience. Um, I'm looking forward to celebrating with families and students across the county. Um, it's just one of my favorite things to celebrate when students cross that finish line. Um, I also was able to go to Bull Run Middle's National Junior Honor Society um, induction ceremony and I was able to speak there, which was really a great honor. I love talking about academics. I love in celebrating student success. Um, and some of the graduation walks at, at the elementary schools have been absolutely awesome. To see the older kids go back into the elementary schools and to see the elementary school children's faces when they see those graduates come through. I mean, they're rock stars. They're so amazing. And the kids just love it. So I've been able to do now four of those. Um, I'm also looking to some fifth grade promotions. I want to say congratulations to Battlefield Boys Soccer Region Champs. Uh, I was able to give that trophy to them, which is the first time I've done that, and it was really exciting. They were so, so excited. I'm super proud of Alvi Elementary's nine-year-old speller, Sia Sampath. She was one of 121 spellers nationally who advanced to the quarterfinals of the Scripps National Spelling Bee, and she's a nine-year-old, so she, she, she's going to be our secret weapon, guys. She is amazing. Next five years. <laughs> yeah. She is very eligible to keep going. No pressure. Um, I um, have run out of time already, so I'm going to skip to this part. Um, just congratulations to all of the retirees, our distinguished retirees across the division, teachers, administrators, principals, um, and some of our executive cabinet. Your knowledge and experience will be greatly missed. Best of luck in your future endeavors. I hope to see many of you as ROPers in our schools because you are so valuable. To all the graduates, I congratulate you. You've worked hard to achieve this accomplishment, showing resilience and determination in the face of difficult circumstances. Class of 2023, you have had only one normal year, <laughs> if you can count this year as normal. All three years of your high school were disruptive in some way. So I just want to give a shout out to all of you. Um, and as you go forward, I wish you the best success in pursuing your personal goals. You will have many opportunities for future success as you continue to work hard and challenge yourself. And I hope this moment in your life is a benchmark in a lifetime of noteworthy achievements. And in the words of A.A. A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh, promise me you'll always remember you're braver than you believe, you're stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Congratulations, class of 2023. Thank you, Ms. Wall. All right. Well, tonight I'm going to present um, some comments in, in my case for public education. Good evening. I want to congratulate all of our graduating seniors and their families for their remarkable achievement. I want to thank all of our families for sticking with our school division throughout the pandemic. We are thankful for your continued trust and commitment to public education. Throughout our history, we have idealized what American public education has done and can do for us. Without a doubt, even with its shortcomings, it is the main reason for American dominance in invention, discovery, and leadership. We know that education can increase civic participation, reduce prejudice and discrimination, and increase lifetime earnings. David Berliner, editor of Public Education, defending the cornerstone of American democracy, writes about tax-funded education systems in 1700s Boston. Thomas Jefferson, believing that universal education was essential to the functioning of our democracy. And Horace Mann, the father of American education and his belief in the common school. After the Civil War, all states enacted laws to ensure public education. We know this did not extend equally to all. That took nearly another 100 years and is still a work in progress. Throughout industrialization, the great wars, desegregation, digital highway, and now a great pandemic, we have continued to face social upheaval, and our schools have been centers of controversy and change as they play a vital role in our society. Our schools are not perfect. Reports such as The Nation at Risk in 1983 and The No Child Left Behind in 2001 are examples of school reform efforts to address achievement and equity. The COVID-19 pandemic spotlighted these issues and exacerbated many of them. 
we are at an inflection point for public education in America. We have tremendous work to do and we must recommit to high standards, equity and accountability as we look to reform educational practices. We must fund education with the same fervor we speak about education. Let me say that again. We must fund education with the same fervor we speak about education. We cannot expect a discount deal to provide a first class experience. First class experiences cost money and we must be willing to make those investments and do it so that resources ensure equitable opportunities for all. I have been and continue to be committed to this vision of public education because I still believe education increases civic engagement, reduces discrimination, provides thriving futures, and as Jefferson put it, essential to the functioning of our democracy. I will leave you with a quote from Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, she read at President Biden's inauguration. I think it is instructive to all of us as we wrestle with how we reform public education together in this county and this country. She says, and yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes, not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. Thank you all and have a great night. The board will now, um, I will accept a motion for um, re-entering closed session. Ms. Wall, if you want to go ahead and read the motion. Okay. Sure, Ms. J uh, Ms. Ms. Williams. Move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711 and 2.2-3712, the Prince William County School Board re-enter closed session for the following reason. One, to discuss with staff the performance of specific officers and employees um, pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1. Two, to evaluate the ombudsman and approve annual performance goals for the Office of the Ombudsman for the 2023-24 year pursuant to the Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1. Three, to discuss with division council and staff actual or probable litigation and specific legal matters involving specific staff and students pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A7 and eight. And four, to consult with legal counsel employed or retained by the school board to receive legal advice regarding the school division's policies on search and seizure pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A, 7, and 8. Do I have a second? I second. Uh, Ms. Wall seconds. Any discussion? Yes. Okay. Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Ralston, motion passed. Okay, we'll re-enter closed session, and I'm not sure when we'll be back. Thank you. All right, let's. Um, all right, folks, we are now entering open session. For everyone to know, the doors should be open. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Officer Patty. Um, we are now entering open session. We need to vote to um, certify closed session. Ms. Wall, you have a motion. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move that pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3712, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board meeting of June 7, 2023, 2023, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Do I have a second? I second. Ms. Ms. Jackson, second it. Any discussion? Please vote. She might have left. We have corn. 
right? We got corn. This corn. Five. She's not been there. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Justin, are you voting? Yes. yes. I voted for you. The vote We're is... We're on video, aren't we? Yes. yes. The vote is six yes, one not president vote, Jesse, one absent, Ralston. Motion passed. All right. At this point, the Prince William County School Board will adjourn.